Hey, hello everybody once again. This is Ian McDonald with Sick Over Magazine. Honored and humbled to uh, bring you this. Well, this live interview tonight uh, with Mr. Elliot Hoffman. Most people know him from Car Bomb. Uh, also joined here by uh, Mr. Ken Schalk. Most people may know you from Candiria. And also we have our moderator co-host, Mr. Dave Call Ross Jr. How's everybody doing tonight? Nice. Fantastic. Doing awesome. <laughs> good, good. How are you, Ian? I'm doing all right, man. Thanks. Just got done right. working about an hour ago and did a little running around and been stoked for this one to come together here for quite a while. So right on. Um, thanks for joining us. Let me take these names off. Um, how's, how are you guys doing? Good, good. I worked all day, too. Just took the dog out. And here we are. <laughs> nice. I'm stoked, too, man. Yeah. Yeah. Well, again, thanks for taking the time to be with us. And uh, this is, you know, like we discussed here for a few minutes beforehand, it's pretty open format. It's pretty chill. Um, so, again, <clears throat> thanks for taking the time out to join us. And what we'll do is I'll just start it off right now with uh, with Elliot, I guess. Um, and we'll go back into your, you know, in, into the early days of Elliot. And I'm interested to know <clears throat> at what age were you? Um, well, first of all, what kind of music were you exposed to growing up in your household? Let's start with that, and then we'll go into the next question. So I, got, I come from a musical family, like my, uh, my old man and my mother. They were both, um, they were both gigging musicians, like in the 80s, uh, playing like they weren't doing original music, but they were doing like club dates and shit to um, like weddings and, and shit like that to, to support the family. So we always had you know, instruments laying all over the house. And uh, my father always had a drum set set up. He was predominantly a key, keyboardist and a bass player. But, um, you know, there would always be a drum set set up in the house. Like he had this like round badge Gretsch kit that with like those blue hydraulic heads on it, like set up in the house. Mm -hmm. And uh, he would stick me behind that all growing up. So by the time I was like five or six, I could, uh, you know, play like, real basic drums. I couldn't reach the pedals yet, but, um, you know, trying to, trying to do my best, uh, starting to play drums, but I, I being exposed, I was exposed to music all the time. You know what I mean? So yeah, it was uh, when I was a kid in the eighties, it was, you know, it was Michael Jackson and it would have, whatever, all the pop stuff in, in the eighties before I got into, um, I didn't really get into the rock or metal stuff, uh, until I started playing with bands, uh, when I was like 10, so it wasn't like, well, I wasn't like super late, but, um, yeah, my, he had a pretty eclectic taste in music. Like I was able to, uh, like once I started getting serious about music, he started putting more serious shit in front of me and just being like, listen to this, listen to that. Like, you know, uh, like Mahavishnu orchestra and return of forever and no. the police. And, you know, he basically just turned me on to really good shit before I knew what, what good really was, you know, and that helped me like get in the right direction um, musically. So that's, that was kind of indispensable just um, from an, an early, you know, being exposed to that, that type of stuff early. Nice. And I, uh, so I started playing drums in the garage <clears throat> along to like, before I listened to metal, I was like playing along to, I don't know, like Caribbean queen or something like that on the, on the PA system or, you know, there was no, no, really, no really good headphones. So it's like my father had a PA system and I would just put the PA system like, in front of the drums and just blast and and play along with it or whatever and uh you know the the guys there was some like the metal delinquent kids in the in the neighborhood like started knocking on my garage door though like, you want to play drums in our band <laughs> and they were like 15 16 and uh they were all metal heads so they're like all right you got to learn this you got to learn anthrax you got to learn slayer you got to learn metallica this is like 88 89 so it was like justice had just come out and i was like listening to that and i was like you know, how's he going? Boom, 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 to to bam, boom, 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 to to bam, to to bam. And playing the high, playing the hi hat over here. So I had to like get another hi. I just put an, another hi hat over there, and I needed to. I needed to like borrow another bass drum for my neighbor, and you know, just piecemeal it together as they try and like learn how to play all this stuff. You know what I mean? So it kind of got thrown in the fire, and it was uh, awesome, awesome way to start. You know, and playing new. I would, my father would play keys with me and bass. Um, and he, he was able to play like split keyboard where he played bass with his left hand and keys with his right hand. Oh. So it'd be almost like playing with a band, like when I was first learning. And um, 
so I, I started playing music. It wasn't like uh, drum drum lessons, you know, playing in marching band wasn't my first, um, you know, exposure to it. It was like really trying to trying to play music from from the get go, you know. So that's crazy. That's, your your dad is is a sick musician. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like it wasn't just like you learn from a, a parent musician. You like you were being influenced. I mean, when I was a kid, you know, somebody you could play two different instruments at the same time. Yeah, he That's was amazing. He's still a killer player. And he, you know, I would like go to him some with him sometimes to like weddings. Like I would help him carry his equipment if they couldn't get a babysitter and he'd just like park me behind the drummer on the bandstand and I'd just be like looking at the drummer all night, you know? Wow. And having having Shirley Temples or whatever, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. <clears throat> yeah. All right. So you mentioned anthrax and you, you you gave us a little piece of harvester of sorrow there and uh you mentioned <laughs> You mentioned some other eclectic things like you have Mahavishnu and whatnot. So the next question going from that would be who there had to be a person or a song or a time that you remember. Maybe there isn't, but I'm hoping there is where you just said, wow, I got to be a drummer. Who who was it? What did it? I mean, I probably like going to my first metal shows. Uh, I, I saw Metallica at the, uh, the Hampton Roads Coliseum. I was living in Virginia Beach at the time. And that was on Justice, and I, I wasn't on the floor, but I was, like, up in a balcony, and I just saw, like, ten circles. They had these, like, concrete dividers on the floor of the um, of the stadium or whatever, and there was just, like, 15 circle pits going all at the same time, and I was just, like, you know, in the, the crumbling, you know, Lady Justice or whatever, and I was just like, oh, my God, this is, like, you know, I had the Lars poster over my bed, like, that, that thing, one of him and in Donington. Where him in front of like eighty thousand people from behind his drum kit or whatever. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. know. The so I think Lars was really like the first. Um, you know, I want. I set up my drums like him. I, I just wanted to. You know, he was like, and Charlie Benante from Anthrax also was like. Really, I got that um, live at the Howard Smith Odeon VHS cassette. You know, let that live concert, and that was like a game changer for me. Just being able to watch him on video up close play a whole concert. You know the thrash i was just you know thrash <laughs> but that you know being able to see lars live and see that see that video of uh of charlie where they had like the over over the kit shops and and all that i was like really really uh pumped for that cool that's awesome <laughs> all right um ken same questions man um same questions what kind of stuff was uh, were you exposed to in your household as a kid, and then going into you know who who mm -hmm. was it for you that made you want to play? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, right off the bat, I can tell you the first drummer that made me want to play was Animal from the Muppets. <laughs> <laughs> that is definitely the truth, no doubt. Like watching him, that was like okay, I definitely. I mean, I was banging and tapping on things earlier, prior to that, but. My first exposure to the Muppets, I'm a little older, I'm 52, so late 70s watching the Muppet show, it was uh, it was just wild to watch him. And whoever the drummer was that actually played drums for him was an amazing drummer. I mean, he did some drum battles and stuff with different drummers. He actually did a drum battle with Buddy Rich that yep. <laughs> excuse me, <clears throat> was pretty insane. I mean, Buddy just ripped it up, but... The guy who played along with him was fantastic. Um, but basically, growing up, I mean, I was exposed to all of the music in the couple of decades leading up to my youth. My Both both my parents loved all types of music, so it was lucky for me to just get to hear music all day, all night. Everything from Motown, doo-wop, rock and roll, <clears throat> even some swing and boogie and stuff. They, they listened to everything, but... Um, I don't know how far the spread was, but there was a radio station growing up in New York called CBS FM 101. And they basically played whatever was kind of current at the time. And then all the oldies and classics prior to that 50s, 60s, like that. So a lot of that, um, just basic general 70s pop music. And of course, Kiss. You know, Kiss made it so far into the mainstream <laughs> that they were pretty unavoidable. You were going to find out about them one way or another. And if you became a fan you became a fan you know so that was another drummer i would say honestly because these are drummers that affected me before i started playing drums so it was like seeing them play or hearing what they played made me want to play drums 
So that would be Peter Chris, especially the the live solo, because I actually I heard the live version of a hundred thousand years before I heard the studio version. So that drum solo in the live version was just that was I was like I I always remember like trying to add drum to it and everything. So I would say Animal and Peter Chris are my absolute two <laughs> beginning drummers that made me want to play. Now, I'm not a huge fan. I shouldn't say fan. I used to love Kiss. I don't really listen to them much anymore, but that was one of the bigger records for me, too. And I don't I don't know if that's the same solo you're talking about, but uh, Love Gun. Uh, from Kiss Alive 1. Okay. There was also a solo on Love Gun that I loved that I used to play all the time. But, yeah, I know the solo you're talking about. Yeah. Incredible. Animal. At the, uh, the face Chris. or the flanger on the drums. It was crazy. Do you have any favorites that got you in that weren't Muppets or wore makeup? Or what's that? <laughs> Did you have any favorites that weren't Muppets or wore makeup? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, <clears throat> literally every drummer. I mean, growing up, even like I was saying, getting to listen to Motown and all those types of oldies and stuff. All those drummers in that music were, I, you know, just I wanted to play drums. I knew it from a young age, you know. My dad did actually play. Uh, he played like banjo and ukulele a little bit. He could fiddle on piano. And it was actually my godmother, my mom's cousin, who bought me a drum set when I was like eight. And she actually did it kind of more like as a, a joke to kind of like, because I was always banging on stuff. So she got it for me. And I don't know if you remember the like those Sears and JC Penny catalogs that you'd get from oh, yeah. around Christmas time. And there was the one page out of the few music pages where they'd have like two or three drum sets. And they were like, you know, just kids' drum sets. So she got me one of those. And strangely enough, my dad, who like I said, could play a little bit, he could fiddle around on it and it inspired me even more. And I would bang on it and we literally just we destroyed it in about six to eight months by june of that following year she got it for me <laughs> for christmas so by june that following year it was destroyed but i mean that really was an amazing validation because having it actually in front of me to 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 fiddle on it made me really realize you know that's that's what i want to do but it would take another few years before i'd actually get my first drum set and then uh from that point on it was go but to try and like you know name one specific drummer really that's animal after that every single drummer i would hear like the cool thing was i was into a lot of like disco and r b so you didn't get names of musicians but my brother started who's a little older than me he started getting into rock so he started listening to led zeppelin the who and whoever else i mean it was just one band after another and as i'm hearing it you know, the drummers are lighting me up, you know, and I'm like, holy cow. So I started getting into rock. And now as a rock fan, you get to learn about bands and the actual musicians in them. They're not just a bunch of like these, you know, secretive studio guys that you never learn the name of, you know. So I started learning who all these drums are, sorry, excuse me, who all these drummers are. And I'm like, OK, this is amazing. So at that point, I guess you could say John Bonham. Keith Moon, Ringo Starr, all of your basic early, you know, Mitch Mitchell, your early on rock drummers. Sure. Those guys are going to be all of my, you know, initial starting point drummers. Um, right after that, though, my brother got the uh, video for Exit Stage Left. And when I heard Neil Peart, then I was like, whoa, that just took it up another notch, you know. Not yeah, knowing, it was, it was a huge one. I was very new. I didn't know about a lot of progressive rock bands or anything. You know, it was just one year at a time learning more and more. So, it yeah. was pretty crazy. R.I.P. Professor coming in and blowing the doors off everything we were used to at that point. That album was so timeless. You know, the thing is, can I? I just want to say something on that because I think kids today they grow up in an environment that is so technically advanced. I don't think they get to appreciate maybe where you know the generation we come from like we were hearing dudes innovate at levels that have been innovated upon another two three times already by this point so it's like to live through those early stages of like progressive innovation it gets it's like you could really appreciate some kids today may listen and be like well man that's not that great and i could understand that 
because the talent level today is just is sky high. It's nuts. It's crazy. This but is true. to be able to live through that and hear like a guy like Neil Peart, it's like that was impressive at that time to have all that incorporated in and the band itself, you know, like Bill Bruford. And yes, I mean, this was advanced stuff to be able to do that. Hugely advanced stuff. Yeah, and back that's then. That's a great name to throw out there in that, uh, in that category. 40, 50 years ago. Yeah. It's crazy. King Crimson, no doubt, too, man. That was... Yep. Yeah. So do you remember, um, like when you were a kid and you got allowance or your first job, do you remember what the first album or cassette or whatever you bought with your own money was? <laughs> Elliot, do you? I, I immediately like started doing, getting into the whole tape trading thing. So I didn't really like, it was like everybody was dubbing each other off, you know what I mean? Uh, so it, I didn't, I was, I was only 10. I didn't have any money. You know what I mean? <laughs> and I was trying to buy like symbols and, and shit, you know what I mean? Because I just started cracking them all immediately. So, uh, allowance. Yeah, yeah. When I was 10, when, I got an allowance for cleaning and my. Yeah, I would mow lawns. And... Yeah, I would mow lawns. I remember I bought a, bought a mowed lawn for an entire summer and bought this Ludwig snare drum that was like my pride pride and joy. Nice. For a minute. <laughs> well, the first, the first music I ever bought with my own money was Led Zeppelin 4. And back to the catalog, you mentioned, you know, like the, the Sears or J.C. Penney or Two Guys or whatever it might have been. My dad used to take me to like the House Guitars in Rochester, New York, and they'd have all those catalogs from different companies. And I'd sign up to get them coming to me in the mail in my bedroom. You know, when most kids, guys, you know, have their bedrooms when they're a kid, they got pictures of, you know, girls or dirt bikes or drums. And mine was like all those kits you know, that you just could never imagine having, like spread out in the catalogs. I cut them out and tape them up on my wall. And, Nice. You know what I did? You know what I did do was the ten CDs for one penny or whatever. Oh, oh yeah, the remember, uh, the, remember that? <laughs> Publishers Clearing House. What was it? What was it called? Oh, yeah, yeah. And they they would have metal stuff on there, so I would just like get everything metal that they, you know, I get the ten. And I don't know how they did that, or you know. But, so you didn't uh, get I did that, a couple on times. that eventually. Like they didn't keep you signed up for. A, a I don't know. They never, they never put me in cuffs. And, right, I remember so. nightmares about that, yeah. but I don't remember <laughs> exactly what they're like. People signed up like, oh, yeah, I'll take this and take that for a penny. And then they yeah. didn't, didn't, you know, sign off and like yeah, leave yeah. or quit. And then they just started getting billed for like tons of money every month. Right. Afterwards. They had to fight to get out of it. If I'm not mistaken, you know, and I could be mistaken about that. Was it Publishers Clearinghouse? I don't think it, it was. It was like one of those, one of those things. Something it was like definitely, that, yeah. It was some kind of scam where they tried to get you on the back end, but uh, they never got Oh, yeah. They get yeah. you oh, yeah. There's a comment <laughs> from another uh, sick drummer, Mr. Lloyd Estevano. <laughs> it is very true. What's up, Lloyd? My first uh, my first purchases were... Um, ah, Columbia House. Actually. This dude nailed it. It was Columbia, Columbia House. House. And BMG. Columbia House, yes. Thank you. I had 45s. Those were my first purchases. Nice. Hear a song on the radio and go to the Sam Goody in the mall and buy a 45. It's awesome. Nice. Yeah. Do you guys have 8-tracks growing up? I missed the 8-track. My, my father did. My father did too. The 8-track was fading out when I was getting of age to start purchasing music. So what I would, I actually had an 8-track player. And if you went to yard sales, a lot of like people were selling their old A tracks. So I picked up a pretty good collection, some Sabbath and uh, what else did I? I think I had a, a couple of yeah, I had Led Zeppelin one on A track. I had I had a decent little box of A tracks of some good rock and roll. So it was pretty cool. That's awesome. Do you have an it was so weird. I had like a weird thing where I like I, I my family moved from New York down to Virginia Beach. My father went to law school down there, so this was like. I moved down there in June, right? And I didn't have any friends or anything. So I set up the drums in the garage. And by August, I was in a band. No, nice. so that was like, that was like, I, I went from like not being like a big music head to like playing drums, listening to a bunch of stuff, and then immediately starting to play in like skater thrash bands. And, and I, I never really did like the whole classic rock thing, or I didn't grow. I, my father would play Zeppelin and Cream and all that shit in the house, but I, I wasn't like, so I, it was weird. Like, so when I started playing, I immediately went into all this other stuff, and I didn't really have the the classic rock back catalog that a lot of my my friends have. You know what I mean? Mm, mm. Like, uh, so yeah, that, I was it, listening to classic rock before I even played drums. Yeah, yeah, totally. 
I was, I was just, I was just listening to pop, maybe ACDC or, you know, just, I wasn't a music fan until like where I would get like OCD about it. You know what I mean? So, yeah. They hadn't yeah. even penned it as classic yet when I was listening. No, to it. no, it was just rock. Yeah. <laughs> it was just rock. Yeah. <laughs> There's another comment in here from my buddy Rick Smith, who I think you guys might have met at the last name. <clears throat> He's a guitar player. He was one of my roommates at the last name. I think you, I know one of you met him. I don't know if both of you met him, but was he up on that roof hanging out until yeah. like three in the morning? Yeah, I, mean, I met that. Yeah, yeah. You would have been there. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for joining us, Rick. That's a hell of a way to remember something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that roof at three in the morning. Yeah, that there was, was the, there was uh, a... that's the fifth floor of the Marriott. Right. The Lanai deck. <laughs> you could call it that. And Dave, I'm sorry if we're throwing around terms that you just don't know what they are, like A track. I'm A tracks. I was born when VHSs were fading out. I'm not that old. <laughs> cool. All right. Oh man, that's great though. I think the, I think the fact that the industry was constantly trying to find a way to make it more portable. You know, I don't see the A track as any different than listening to music on our phone you know it's just a constant progression to get music to our ears as efficiently as possible i like that part of the industry i appreciate that mm -hmm. i think as music lovers you know i mean i don't know how you guys are but one thing i do find as a as a musician it's not always easy to find time to listen to music but for sure when, but as a listener as a lover of music when i am it's like to have so many ways of listening to it now. You I, know. Had a, I had a book like this thick of CDRs, you know, like the CD book. Oh, yeah. yeah. All, all, all burned CDs in there. And, I, you know, once I was able to drive, that was in the car. And it was like, yeah. You know, I mean, you have like a 60 disc changer in the trunk. No. <laughs> no the the <laughs> progress, though, is, is pretty amazing. Those. amazing. You know, it, if, if you put on an album or a record, it's like, you couldn't actually thrash around too hard because you can make the records skip. Totally with the CD, the CD uh, Walkman, especially in the city. Like that's you know, right, CD Walkman. Just riding the riding the subway. Yeah, I got some no. of my best listening done in the subway growing up. You know. Eight tracks would bounce <laughs> around too if you hit them. We had we had a car with an eight track in it when I was a kid. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's how car bombs songwriting is actually influenced. That was my influence around with the Dipping. CD player. <laughs> Just just drop a beat here, drop a beat there. Yeah, that was pretty quick right there. <laughs> oh, bro, you guys literally serious. You guys are just absolutely mind boggling. I love you guys. <laughs> just chop it all. We just chop. Oh, bro, you, know, you it's are like like, like uh, how how would you say it? you're like like it's compositional glitch. Yeah, it's like totally. You on really, purpose. you screw yeah. around with tempo and time in such a purposeful way. It's 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 mind boggling. I love it. Yeah, yeah, I love that shit. You know, well, you know, Candiria yeah. did that as well. If you don't, you know, agree uh, or not, but they did, right? I mean, <laughs> that was well, you know, as as crazily talented as Elliot is, the first time I met him, his singer had a a, a double beer can hat on, drinking beer, <laughs> and the, the song it was it was more like a Frank Zappa bar band. It was oh, yeah, way crazy. I mean. And at the time, he could do the foot clave, so you know we were all. I was just playing a lot of clave. Oh, we got in that, that crazy band, yeah. foot independence. Watch out, this guy's <laughs> insane. Is this when Spooge played with Car with uh, Candiria? Yeah, in New York? yeah, uh -huh. I, yeah. There's, it was like yeah, Rockville Center. I think we had it was the first gig we played together, mm -hmm. and I saw you guys, and I was just like, holy shit! It was like, like I by that point I had like studied Moeller method or whatever, and his like his fucking whip was like. All the way, you, I, you, I can't even fit it on the screen. You know what I mean? Because it was just like, <laughs> whoa, whoa. and it's just fucking going like this, like super fluid. And I was just, I was just blown away. I was like, holy fuck! Yeah, no, nobody's got the feel like you, man. It's like, uh, it's, it's insane, insane, dude. Well, let's go back a second yeah. before we pass on that topic, because I'm, I mean, I kind of know already the answer, but for everybody else, and it's interesting, Dave. Uh, what kind of music were you listening to when you were a kid in the household? <laughs> That's funny you ask. Um, yeah, no. Uh, my dad being in suffocation and malevolent, I was always hearing him and Hobbs and everybody would come into the house all the time. 
And we had the TV in the living room, and I'd be sitting there playing on the little PlayStation sitting on the floor, so everybody would come in and see me. Um, so I'd, I'd hear mostly what he heard and just what was kind of on the radio at the time. Um, like, the main stuff I remember sticking out was, like, Slipknot, you know, Fear Fact. I'm showing my age here. Totally. I'm so, so in a different ballpark. But it was, like, Slipknot, uh, Fear Factory, Drowning Pool, you know, all these, like, new metal bands, System of a Down. Um, I didn't really get into death metal until probably late high school when I started getting back into metal music. How old are you, Dave? 20. Oh. <laughs> you were talking about 30 years ago, and I'm like, I'm half that age. Nice. So yeah, Can, was, was Candlemass another or like Cryptopsy? Was that like Candle. later on? Yeah, because I remember your dad used to show me stuff like that when I used Candlemass buff. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Uh, shout out to Joey Jordanson, man. Yeah, that dude. Let me oh, tell yeah. you, that's an innovator right there, and not just in the sense of like what he did, but. To have the platform to bring that extreme drumming to the masses, that's big. I've always been, you know, that's always been something like for guys like Elliot and me, we come from an arena of metal that's pretty extreme, but it's also very progressive. So when any kind of drummer or band breaks out into a much wider audience, it just opens the doors more for the music that we make. So. Cheers totally. to Joey and the band for doing that so many years yeah, ago. Yeah, Joey, I think, influenced, like, the modern drum sound kind of a little bit because, it, you know, how everything now is programmed, it's like, you know, everything is like the velocity is, like, all the way up, even if it's, like, programmed drums or whatever. He would play like that acoustically. It was mm -hmm. just like everything was at 100% all the time, even though it wasn't, like, slick, slick dynamic shit, but it was just, like, you know, fucking all the way all the time. Oh yeah. You know, so that's uh, I th that I think that had a huge impact, like on on a lot of the modern metal uh, sound, just in general. Mm. Yeah, mm. for sure. Oh yeah. Yeah, for sure. That's a good point. I never even thought about like almost like what are the origins of that? You know, very yeah. Well, once the drum, yeah, once like sound. yeah, the the drum plugins started getting more uh, more predominant or whatever. They, it almost it, to me it almost sounded like it was mimicking his type of tone right. you know what i mean yep, yeah because yep. it's it's like let's just make everything loud as loud yeah. as it goes which is like what he sounded like acoustically mm -hmm. so yeah i would almost <laughs> i would almost go back and say that you could maybe contribute some of that advancement to even you know some of the earlier motley crew stuff you know, before he did the spinning cage oh yeah yeah even like a, honor for a rock in a rock setting for sure yeah yeah absolutely yeah. Dave, did you have anything else about the uh, the growing up part and, and any of that, like bands and music in the house before we pass that topic up? No, I didn't really get back into music until I was in high school. So, you know. Do you play any instruments, Dave? Are you a drummer? I got two guitars. One's right there. The other one's in the corner of my room. And I picked up playing when I was younger, but never really followed through with it. So I, took, I started taking lessons in high school and just went from there with guitar. Just start a death metal band, bro. <laughs> <laughs> well, he did start a death metal uh, radio show up at Ithaca. I did. Oh, nice. When I was in college, nice. I started my own my own radio show with the local uh, the college station that we had. Nice. That was fun. It sucks, though, because it was Sundays, and it was one hour. So every other show was like two hours long. But... Yeah. Get no love. <laughs> no love. <laughs> yeah. Just like other bands, you make more money on the road, and yeah. death metal's uh, just welcome. Take... Welcome to my life. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. you got twenty five minutes now. Yeah, go. <laughs> well, let's see. Quick shout out to Elliot. Met you in Edmonton last October. Thanks for joining us, Curtis. Edmonton, yeah. A. A. That was a good one. So Ken, um, yes. You spent what twenty four years, if I'm not mistaken, in Candiria. Does that sound accurate? Well, we started the band in February of nineteen ninety two. So let's do the math from there. I mean, Too late for math, man. <laughs> so thirty. 32. I mean, we. You know, I moved to L.A. in in, <laughs> in middle of two thousand six, like early two thousand six. So we kind of all like drifted apart for a little while. But then when we kind of got back together, you know, it only lasted a little bit before they moved on that other way. 
Yeah. So I don't know how you would do the math for that, you know. It was a long time. <clears throat> long, a long, long time. time, yeah. Five albums worth. Yep, yep, yep. You did everything up to the first one with Danny Grosser in 2016, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, the last album we recorded before that was Kiss the Lie. And uh, that 2000, was... 2008. <clears throat> that's when it was released. We We actually recorded it. We wrote it and recorded it through December 2005 and January 2006. And then they finished recording it through that spring, but it never got released until 2008. Hmm. Just because of, yeah. a, you didn't want to put it out yourself? You were waiting to put it out on a label like it was Rising Pulse, if I'm not mistaken? Um, well, initially at the time, what happened was basically we put out What Doesn't Kill You, went on tour, had to come off the touring cycle like Eric couldn't play anymore live. Then we had to come off for the lawsuit in 2005. Then we started going back out to tour again. But the guys that we had gotten to kind of replace, it just wasn't working out. So we went back home off tour. And we were like, let's just write another album. So we spoke to Dave Bendeth and we were like, we were going to make another album. And he's like, OK, go ahead. So the initial plan was to release a second album on Type uh, Type A Records, which was the one that what doesn't kill, you. kill You was on. Right. But after I moved to L.A., I don't really know what happened logistically or contractually, but it just got stalled until 2008. So like I said, I kind of drifted away at that. Once I moved to L.A., I really you know, kind of didn't really do anything with the band. We yeah. almost revived it again between 2009 and 2011. We wrote a, a, about like a chunk of like four songs or so, and we were going to try and work on something, um, which wound up becoming, one of them became the drum tracks for one of the songs on the, uh, on that, uh, actually two of them. That's right. I got two drum tracks on the, uh, Refresh my memory. What's the song they did with the album they did with Danny? What's it called? While they the last sleeping? one. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's While it. they were, yeah. So there are two tracks on there that I play drums on. Those are from that that bulk of recording from oh nine to oh eleven to uh, two thousand eleven. I saw them on tour with that record with Danny playing um, when they were the first time back after that long break. You know, mm -hmm. they got on the tour spot. He's a killer drummer. It's weird because I've seen him with Candaria and I saw you with Candaria way, way back in probably, <clears throat> I don't remember if it was The Process or if it was 300% uh, record, but uh, it might have been 300%. You were played at the mm -hmm. Penny Arcade in Rochester, New York. Mm -hmm. we, were, we were supposed to actually open up for you, but it didn't work out. Oh, um, okay. And it was a night where there was some, uh, there was a, a, a female concert goer that was on the pool table doing things she shouldn't be doing to herself on a pool table. And I was sitting next to Carly and he looks over at me. He's like, does this kind of stuff happen all the time around here? I'm like, no, man, <laughs> it's just cause Candaria is playing here. And he started uh, laughing. Oh <laughs> man. But yeah. I, well, Rochester. I, 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 I still haven't seen car bomb live and I've seen you live with Candaria, man. I, fuck. Thank you. Oh <laughs> yeah. Insane. <laughs> yeah. We ran through Penny arcade a few times. Yeah. Cool. That's a cool place. We like that place. I mean, it's long gone now, but uh, it was a cool place. Uh, for see a lot yeah, of good bands. Good room, definitely a good room to play for sure. What we was finally your... got to bu finally got to Buffalo this year, and you didn't hang out. You were busy. I had to pick my nose. Yeah, <laughs> I had things to do. I don't know. <laughs> I, 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 was in town. To I think I was in San Francisco for work when you were in Buffalo. I know. I'm just joking. Man. I'm just lying anyway. I was right around the corner. I was like, eh. <laughs> Fuck that guy. Don't feel like it. <laughs> Not today. No, dude, I would uh, any, just come through Rochester. Tell you what, next tour you book, it has to have Rochester on it. What's the place to play in Rochester now? Um, right now, they just reopened up the Water Street Music Hall, which is good. There's a place called Anthology, which is the best place to play in Rochester, I would say. Um, there's another place called Photo City Music Hall that's doing pretty well. Nice room. And then you still got the the bug jar, which is really small, but it's been there forever. And there's also the Montage Music Hall, which is a pretty good venue that gets a lot of death metal acts. There's a few. 
which is That's nice. Cool. Yeah, you got a few venues. That's awesome. We definitely have a few good venues for good size, you know, metal shows and whatever else kinds of shows, you know, come through. Yeah, man. You no, know, pretty cool. That's what would show. what would be your favorite out of the piece of the material you did record with with Candiria? Which record? Do you have a favorite? Like from a drumming perspective? Yeah. Uh, three hundred percent density. Me too. <laughs> yeah. Raise your hand if that's the same answer. Monstrous. <laughs> it's fucking monstrous fucking record. It's the tough we, put, we put a lot of we put a lot of work into that album. Like we we knew we had to do a lot to lift our personal bar above the process of self development album. So we wanted to really take our style of writing to as I guess, it, and we realized it too after we did it and toured it and had to write a new album. We were like, we got to go in a different direction because three hundred percent density really was our like. That was the apex of that kind of sound, you know. From I'll go all the way back to um, to um, <coughs> to uh, sorry, subliminal, the four song demo that we did way back in '94. I love like that, that was like That's... more of the origins of our chapter like songwriting. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I would say 300% density is like that final point of that Taken style the... developed. Yeah. You couldn't really, we couldn't really do it any further than that. So well, to me, both of them are masterpieces, the process and 300%. Process was fun. The, uh, the code, like we had a guy come in, like we would kind of kind of like a co-producer in the process um he's a famous not famous in the world regard but like in the industry his name is bob and they called him night bob because there were two bobs that worked at the studio he was at at the time and he was the night guy so he got the nickname night bob but he's a international sound guy works i actually know big, night bob you yeah, know night we were talking he was doing uh, so. I, my girl was, sings for this uh, Led Zeppelin cover band. It's uh, Led Zeppelin. They're called, and he does some live sound for them. Oh right, so, yeah. He's got some crazy local sound gigs with some big bands. Man. First, first time I met him, he's yeah, what a fucking character that guy is. Oh, oh he's yeah. amazing. Yeah. It's and at the time, he was hanging out with our co-producer Mike Barilli. So yeah, he yeah. was bringing in all these crazy pedals and stuff. He actually got a Leslie into the studio. Nice. He got so many amazing things into the studio and was so involved yeah. in the creative process. It was amazing to have him around. And he actually said that that album remind it was like the uh, pro it was like the dark side of the moon of heavy metal almost. <laughs> Nice. He he was he was really it was and I don't know I don't think he meant from a, even a compositional standpoint but just when you think about like how at the time Pink Floyd was really trying to push experimental the in the studio of recording yeah. studio recording and stuff and we were like we were doing all bunch of crazy shit on that recording. Nice. That, that was our most experimental album I would say. Yeah, that's why it's one of my favorites. Yeah, we went we went deep on that one. We did some crazy shit. We literally, while we were mixing Temple of Sickness, Mike Barilli, he stops in that part. I don't know, the part that goes bam, 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 bam. In there, you hear two tambourine hits. That wasn't in the initial recording. We were literally mixing. And he, and he stops. He goes, dude, go get a fucking tambourine. <laughs> <laughs> and he tells me to do that. And, and I did it. And, we, and it got added to the mix down right then and there that day. That's awesome. Crazy, I, can hear it. I can hear it in my head right now. When you, when you... <laughs> yeah. Insane. He, he, he would come in at these, like, he added so many gems of extra things with me. Like, dude, you got to put some percussion here. Dude, let's add this here. Like, his, his integration into the development of those songs was massive. I love the percussion overdubs, like, on that stuff. It just makes the whole, it's like, turns the fucking turns it into a party you know what i'm saying yeah like, absolutely can... absolutely yeah. now you yeah. when's the last time you touched a trumpet <clears throat> a trumpet yeah i thought you played trumpet as well with key did you play keyboards and trumpet and drums a on some long lessons? time ago yeah i i i basically i love trumpet but i i couldn't really you know and there's only so many things i could do you know so yeah. i was like 
if I want to keep going with this, it's just time that I can't devote. Like on those on those early demos, you were play, you were playing key, you were playing the keys on those, like all the sus stuff and like the horns and all that. I would play Was, whatever you know I I I could you know until we could get other people to play it. Yeah, I played everything else. Pretty nice. Much. Yeah. Damn. It's impressive. Silly. Silly. <laughs> <laughs> whatever. Amazing. Well, you know, I mean, we wanted to, 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 again, you know, we were an experimental band. We wanted to be multi-genre and, and have a, a crazy sound. So we needed to get it. Did you ever get to play no. with the band Yoke? Do you know Yoke? Yeah, they were from Binghamton. No. Really crazy Maybe stuff. we did. I don't know. I don't know. But it was reminiscent of both your guys' sounds with, with Spooge and, and Candiria. And they were, you know, five-piece and... They did a lot of experimental stuff like that. Amazing band. They haven't been around for a while, but they were really fantastic. Yeah, Yolk. Like Egg Yolk. Y-O-L-K? Yep. I'll send you links to them later. You'll nice. dig it. Yo, definitely, do. I'm always down to, to check out music I've never heard of. Yeah, early 90s, there was like a slew of just crazy fucking bands, man, that were I'd listen to, and I'd be like, holy shit, amazing. Well, I told you there was a band up here in Rochester. <clears throat> this actually, the the drummer ended up being Bron Daler's drum tech for like fifteen years with Mastodon. Oh shit! And they were around at the same time Spooge was around, and if at, at least back then. What's the name not, of the band again? I'm, I'm right here. It is because I cannot tell sometimes. Well, I, I can tell now, but ten years ago, if someone played. Uh, Spooge alongside of this other band called Pigmaster. I wouldn't have been able to tell the difference. I swear to you. I don't know if you've ever Pig heard Master? Pigmaster. Pigmaster. It's almost <laughs> it's almost like another record from Spooge. I shit you I not. I love band names, man. Amazing. If you've never heard that, I'll send that to you. In fact, I'll what, is, what is is that like a farm term? Like, or is that just just mixing two words together because it sounds cool? <laughs> I like, is know. there like a farmer like who, who raises pigs and he's the pig master? Is that like an actual term? <laughs> Don't listen to pig destroyer. Yeah, I know that band. Pig destroyer is fucking crazy. Well, pig destroyer <laughs> got their name because they wanted to call themselves something else, but they didn't want to be so racy because it was against cops. Right, right. Ah, it was like okay. I hate cops or fuck the cops or whatever, but they didn't want to be so brash, so they ended up going with pig destroyer. Uh huh. Okay. And the funny... I actually literally related it to like like a slaughterhouse type of thing. Okay. I was wearing my pig destroyer shirt in a store a few months back and some police officers came in for whatever. Uh, someone had run a car into the front of this building, right? So they're, they're, they walk in to talk to the owners and whatever and this cop looks over at my shirt hmm. and right next to him. It's like pig destroyer. He's like, oh, that's an interesting name for a band. Um <laughs> What's that about? I'm like, oh, they're a grindcore band. He's like, what, is, what does that mean? Pig Destroyer. I'm like, oh, it was my nickname in college. <laughs> he lost it. He started just dying laughing. I'm like, I got to go. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. <laughs> nice. Um, oh, man. The band name. I know this is an old question. It's probably everywhere else online, but I want to hear it from you. Candiria, from what I looked up was some kind of school of parasitic Amazonian fish. Is that totally wrong? Yeah, yeah, it's absolutely wrong. It's can <laughs> that is that is Kandiru. Yeah, but that's yeah. what it says on, on go ahead. Here's, what does it really here's, mean? Here's what I believe happened. This is what I believe happened. Basically the band was not Candiria. Um at the time they were a band called um what were they? Fallen Fallen Angel, I think was the name. And I was playing in another band. It was like funky, red hot, chili pepper style band. And they had their their thing on the wall, you know, like looking for drummer because they were kicking out their drummer and changing their sound. They wanted to go to a, a, a more death metal sound from a metal sound. Raging Angel, that was the band. Sorry. Now, we knew them. Me and my other friends knew Raging Angel. They were a metal band. Their drummer... He sucked. That was a compliment to say he sucked. He really was bad. He would mess up with time. Every time he played a drum fill, he was always late or early. He was bad. <laughs> and, you know, eventually they had to get rid of him. So basically they wanted to start this death metal band, but they were still Raging Angel. So when they were changing over, Eric said, I want to call the band Candiria. 
and we asked what it means. And he said, I found it in a medical dictionary. But we, you know, he was, we were all kind of potheads, whatever, at the time. So he didn't have a specific memory of what it meant or anything. But that was his line. I found it in a medical dictionary. And I was like, whatever, it sounds cool. Let's keep it. I'm going to have to look that up. Then Must be, uh... we, we actually found out at the time, I think it was on either Metal Blade or Relapse, there was a band called Candiru. And that's when we found out that that was the parasitic fish. And then that's when I went into like, you know, conspiracy theory mode. And I was like, I bet this fucking pothead motherfucker was looking through the medical dictionary, saw Candiru or saw Candida, which is the yeast infection that women get. And he changed it into Candiria. And now we're like a hybrid of a fucking fish and a yeast infection. <laughs> So that's where I think it, it wound up landing. That's tragic oh, no. and hilarious. <laughs> I don't know if there's two varying differences that you could be misconstrued with that are that funny. It's, it's that, Wow. Yeah, I can see wow. medical wow. dictionary going towards Candida. I could see that easily. But why he was looking in a medical dictionary, like, like that's why I like. Oh, you know what? He did work for uh, GHI at the time. When we first started the band, he was working for a medical insurance company. So there is, I played, there I is played a in possibility band. he could have been roaming through some medical terms and saw that. Or just so. listening to Carcass, you know? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> uh, I, like, as soon as Carcass came out, I immediately started a Carcass ripoff band and all of our lyrics were like medical shit and I put a microphone with a pitch shifter on it i was like oh just like grinding you know nice. that only lasted that only lasted about six months or something my introduction <laughs> to death metal was obituary and oh, yeah. to go from like like a guy who's barely singing any lyrics to then a couple of years later getting into carcass and being like holy cow <laughs> the, the lyrical contrast <laughs> yeah yeah amazing obituary is a good one to be your first exposure Bro, well, I had a friend, Larry, that worked at Roadrunner. So it was, uh, what was it, 1987, I think, or 88, somewhere around what? there. What, Slowly Rot? Yeah. yeah. Oh, that was 89, 90, 89. 89. Yeah. Because he gave yeah. me the, he gave me a, um, we would get like, uh, me and my friends would get the, um, you know, those, um, those pre, the, the pre-release. Pre-release, yeah. Yeah. So it, it was either 88 or 89. It was before it came out. Yeah, yeah, sick. And hit the whole thing was we were like progressing slowly. We were into Anthrax, Slayer, and all that, but we hadn't really entered into the world of death metal. But he came home one day, we were hanging out, and he was like, Bro, you got to hear this band. He goes, This is so crazy. He's like, Some of the songs, I don't even think the guy has lyrics. <laughs> he literally <laughs> said that, whether that was true or not. But when I took the cassette home and popped it in, it sounded like he it didn't, didn't have sound like lyrics. lyrics. Yeah. <laughs> It no, was that just, was a game changer. And I yeah. was just like, he ripped me apart. Like the way he was like kind of gutturally, like almost vomiting out the lyrics. It was, uh, it was so, yeah, it. nothing, it was, nothing and, like that. And all the inverted fifth chords. I mean, that was a whole new sound. It was like, I was like, okay, I love this band. Really? Yeah. That, that's like what my, started. I call, it. I call it at the gates, like the across the pond obituary. <laughs> there's nothing like that until they came around but yeah that's no that that like first wave of death metal like changed my life i immediately stopped playing thrash i started playing in death metal bands and grindcore bands oh yeah and that's it that's like nice. yeah that was like 90 like mid 1990 it was just i'm going oh, in this direction yeah yeah it was yeah. exploding malevolent creation killer that was another band that yeah. i fell in love with gore guts uh who else hit me hard? Um, even, you know, even like before the, the extreme part of the death metal, Sepultura, when my friend, again, you know, this Roadrunner guy was just hooking us Beneath up. Beneath the Remains, so. yeah. Yeah, we got Beneath the Remains. <clears throat> All right. I was like, whoa, this is just yeah. crazy. Because at the time, we mostly, it was like Charlie Benante and Dave Lombardo were like the two guys with the fastest feet. Right. And when uh, Igor came in, it was like, oh, shit, okay. Yeah. This dude's fast. It's it was pretty crazy. 
some of the picking on that album too. It's fucking crazy, dude. crazy, crazy. crazy. It, yeah. it, to follow it up with a rise too. I mean, the two of their best, their two best records, in my opinion, and two of the best records in the history of death metal, in my opinion. Mm. Mm. Insanity. Arise is one of my all-time favorite records. Really? I mean, oh yeah. I, wow. Yeah, all, the, all the time. Well, while we're talking, I, I feel like I wanted you guys to do um, this roundtable thing, but I'm having so much fun just not following the script at all. Um, <laughs> we'll get to that in a minute, but let's take a quick break because I want to just throw out some, um, you know, some credit to the the gear you guys proudly endorse. Um, so right now, what we'll do is we'll just take a quick break and we'll. Uh, Check a little piece out from Evans, and we'll be right back in uh, about 30 seconds. Hold tight. The most technically advanced drummers in the world require the most technologically advanced drumheads. Bit of a no-brainer when you think about it. In any case, we're more than happy to oblige. Nice. So, uh, Elliot. Yeah. Aside from Spooge and uh, Carbomb, I know there was a couple other bands listed online, but <clears throat> I really don't know too much of anything else, to be honest with you. I won't pretend to know everything because I don't. But I've heard there were other bands that you were part of, but I haven't found anything. Um, maybe I'm wrong. No, besides those two, like the only the, – I was in a couple of like death metal bands at Virginia Beach before I moved back up to New York in 93. And we used to play shows. like We, we played some great death metal shows like down in that – in. Uh, the Virginia, Richmond, D.C. area, but then no, we never got past the demo phase in any of those bands. So that's, uh, yeah, that's not the only thing of, and and then Spooch never really got past the demo phase either, you know. So I, I think the first album on a label that I actually put out was in 2007 when Carbom Car- put Central. out the first record. Yeah, but I had been playing since I was a kid, but it was it never got past demos. So what about? Bereaved or Maelstrom or Terminal Lovers? Any of these bands? Like, did you? Terminal dream? Lovers is not is like some old dude named Elliot Hoffman who was like a music producer in the seventies. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. I think he produced that record. It's a weird thing, but uh, yeah, Bereaved was one of the death metal bands. Maelstrom was a New York band that was pre Spooge. So I moved back up to New York and I started looking in the through the ads, like in Good Times or whatever that that you know the rock rag of newspaper was like the, the bi-monthly, you know, they'd have the classifieds in the back for looking sure, for sure. musicians. And there was this like a band, you know, influences King diamond ripping corpse and uh, you know, somebody else. And uh, I, I replied, I replied to the ad and it turned out to be this band Maelstrom, which was like, like kind of like European power thrash kind of shit with like, you know, Renaissance fair themed lyrics and all this stuff. So I, I joined the band. They were great players. The singer wasn't too great, but uh, so I, I basically wasn't into it just because by that point I was listening to like Mr. Bungle and Primus and all the stuff that wasn't wasn't thrash anymore. And I was listening to a lot of Zappa, so I couldn't really like take the serious lyrics very seriously. Right. And uh, we ended up kicking out the singer and uh, dropping all the songs and starting Spooge, which was basically like a culmination of like all the metal stuff mixed in with, you know, Primus and Zappa and Bungle and all, all that stuff. Yeah. Which you could hear. You guys were crazy. Yeah, it was all, it was all over the place. That's and you it. gave it, we, we got a cassette from you, so it's like long gone. I'll never get to hear those songs again. What up, Anthony? I think uh, our bass player put all of them up on uh, Bandcamp. We put the demos up on Bandcamp. Yeah, for free. Oh. So you could just gra- Yeah, you could just grab them. Yeah. Oh, I gotta go check it out. Thank you for it's telling fun. me that. Yeah, yeah. If you got some time, just uh, you know, go down memory lane or whatever. Bro, we used to it. listen to that cassette all the no time, choice. man. <laughs> now wait a minute. You said yeah. I, I don't know if, if I missed something there. What was on Bandcamp? Uh the Spooge stuff. Okay, anything else? Do you have is there any of that now would you would you call the Maelstrom maybe an early like pirate metal or no, it wasn't pirate. It was more like uh, they were big fans of like uh, like like Saxon and and like European power thrash shit, like Creator and. But the guitarist was like an Ingve in- freak, so it was like neoclassical power thrash. <laughs> shit, you know what I mean? So, Shout out to Creator. Oh, yeah. it, extreme aggression oh. changed my life. 
Yeah. Pop that drum fill. I, I don't remember the name of the song, but growing up, like we had a friend, we called him, his name was John. And he turned us on to the bands like Creator and stuff like that. That extra, you know, pushing up. That was like 86, 87. Yeah. When I first heard Stream Aggression, that, uh, that was like my favorite record at the time. And it was amazing. Ventor, the drummer, like they'd be playing tempos, but the feet couldn't quite keep up to the tempos <laughs> so it was like always like a little behind and out of time but that was like the charm of it you know what i mean yeah. Was, oh yeah he was going for it he was going oh, for yeah. it baby. we yeah. just filmed him <laughs> a couple months ago we just filmed him again amazing is he well, playing with creator uh, pleasure to yeah. kill that was the song oh pleasure to kill too yeah with the, the sure drum is. fill in the beginning <laughs> yeah those so, are the creator records so out of your out of your um discography i'll ask the same question that i asked ken um, what's your? Do you have a favorite record um, from the Carbomb discography? That uh, well, well, you've got Centralia. You've got. Um, I'm not even sure how to pronounce the www. Yeah. <laughs> then you got Meta and Mordial, and now is the Santa Cruz live album out yet, or it's coming out? Soon? It's out Friday. Okay. It's out this Friday, yeah. And so then we got, got another one in the work too. Is oh, it yeah? like a, a conglomeration of all? It's one shows? show live in one Santa Cruz. Cruz. Yeah. Yeah, we recorded every night, and that night just turned out to be super tight. So we were like, let's just do a live record from one show. and Okay. You know, mix nice. it. And, yeah. Did you record it yourself? Uh, well, the sound guy uh, multi-tracked it, you know, at, off the digital console live. Sure, so sure. we had a multi-track of the show, and uh, we were able to – and he also mixed it. It's um, this guy, Johan Meyer, who does live sound for Gojira, and he's also their, their uh, studio guy. He does all their recordings and – and awesome. they, Go, Gojira wasn't out at that point, so he came out for us for five weeks when we were out with uh, Between the Buried and Me earlier this year. Yeah, and he, awesome. he kills it. Yeah. And the mix he threw on the live record, it sounds, you know, sounds stellar for a live recording. Yeah, I was really happy with it. So All the, temp, all the tempos are way faster than the album version, that's for sure. So you and the, guy, <laughs> you, you and the guys in, in, in Carbomb all have – you know, very good jobs and you tour when you can take vacation time. Is that accurate? It's not even vacation time really. Cause we're all kind of self-employed. So mm -hmm. we just make the time, you know? Okay. Yeah. And we all work when we're on the road quite a bit, you know, it's like uh, it looks, it looks like a mobile office, you know, <laughs> the singers and conference calls and you know, I'm, I'm coding and fucking it, we're all working. Basically. I try to tell my clients like I'm, I'm going to be kind of loose for the next month or whatever, but, and they're, understanding thankfully but so yeah, i was thinking so in my head like you've always seemed to be when you go on tours you you're selective and you get some great offers from other bands with great drummers like Mushugi we've been super you. lucky yeah between the barrier to me did they ask you out did they ask you to go on? Yes, it, yeah yeah i mean blake richardson is ridiculous you know what i mean great player dude great yeah. Every tour you yeah, go between on, like, like crazy touring drum. with like him, uh, with Blake Richardson, fucking Thomas Hawk on tour, Matthew Garska on tour, uh, Joe Duplantier. Like, I've been able to tour with like some of the top drummers, and it's been like super cool for me. And none of those were through booking agents, they were all invites because they, they dig the car bomb stuff, you know what I mean? That's awesome, which is which is kind of unheard of for a signed act to get that kind of uh love, you know. Ash so from Revocation uh, just popped in. What's going on, Ash? Thanks for joining us. Ash is killer. What's Ash up, is, baby? I just saw him. Uh, I just saw him like four or five nights ago. He was ripping it up. Me too. Yeah, I was taking video. Nice. Love that guy. <laughs> yeah. So, what's your favorite? Do you have a favorite out of your uh, the repertoire? Repertoire. I don't know. Like, I probably the first record, like just drumming wise for me, because that was like a backlog of like five. I haven't. I didn't do any recording for a bunch of years. And it was like a bunch of fusion shit that I just needed to get out of my system. And it, it, it was kind of like the, you know, the equivalent of like the early uh, Candiria demo stuff where it was kind of like, we hadn't really got a, gotten a sound together yet. You know what I mean? So it was more just like all over the place and like, kind of like tech grind fusion type of stuff and uh, no, no triggers, a lot of dynamics and stuff like that in there before, um, before we kind of like honed our sound, which is more, you know, I don't want to say dynamic list, but it, you know, if you got a trigger, I can't, I can't really lay low. Like if I do like a dynamic section, I got to like leave the bass drum out completely now, you know? So I, 
I'd probably go with Centralia as my favorite record. Yeah. Me too. And meta. But yeah. was it is it difficult for you to play live without the singer when you had to do that? Did that was it I never had the singer in my ears. It's just me and guitar in the ears. Wow. Yeah. I mean if, as long as me and Greg are yeah, I don't listen to anything but, but guitar and myself. Yeah. Well, so it it's, a, it's a, a loop at all. <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah, if I had Mike in my ear, I'd probably fucking go crazy. That's the same. I'm, that's, I did the same thing with Candiria. Yeah. Most of the you time, need... even the singer, you get enough from the front monitoring. I mean, well, I don't, you know. If you're using overheads, it, it all bleeds through anyway a little bit, you know. Yeah. So, so but just guitars. Bass, I felt it. You know, yeah. I only referenced it a few times. It was only a few times where I needed to hear what Mike was doing in, in like a little opening. Yeah. And on the rare occasion, if the stage reference wasn't so good, I was like, you know, leaning forward to, to try and check what was happening. Yeah. But for the most part, just guitar like Elliot. That's all I needed to just drive it home every time. Yeah, I, I find that a common thing for a lot of metal drummers. Like they don't want any anything but guitar in their yeah. ears and drums. Yeah. It's yeah. odd. Yeah. I'm not odd. I'm odd because I have a really hard time tracking without vocals because I play a lot to the singer. And I was now, that's a it. different thing. If if you are like, like I definitely heard enough of Carly from the front monitors that I didn't need him in my monitors. Sure. You know, so to say that I didn't want to hear him is, it's just a, a how loud I wanted to hear him, you know? Yeah. I think it's so, like maybe Elliot feels the same way. Like as the drummer, I, I just, you know, the guitars really just keep you on that aggro side of playing what you got to play. Yeah. I don't know. That's what, it, that's what it felt like to me. Just hearing the guitars made me just drive harder. Yeah. If the guitars and the drums are locked super tight, then everything else kind of is, is in place, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So that's so what I need. I need to hear that because everything is like the all super staccato shit. Exactly. Even with Candiria also, like uh, that's got to be exactly you know. the pocket and the and the rhythmic tightness was so important. So yeah. So when you central. track, do you prefer vocals or not? When you track, both of you. Uh, it's just, it's just guitar and drums. Oh, yeah, pretty much own. guitar and drums. I don't like bass because then bass starts to like intrude. I mean, I'm. To me, like if it's recording, it's like I don't even keep much drums either. It's generally just the reference music with with if there's bass in it. I try to keep the bass like a some kind of high pass to cut the super low end or the low out. Yeah. Yeah. Because what I do is I actually I wear earplugs and then I just blast the click and I just you know, it's like I have just enough music to hear my guide and just the click and sometimes no drums to very little drums. Nice. With Carbomb, I'm not using a, a click or any backing track. So I just have, like, the guitar. He, he's using, like, Axe Effects. So I have, like, a nice, clean guitar DI in my ears with a with a drum mix. And that's – it, it saves, my, saves my ass, too, because I used to have to, like, smash really hard to get over – if you're playing with a wedge next to you, you know? With the in-ears, it's like I don't have to hit as hard, like, so I don't break cymbals as much and I don't accidentally fatigue <laughs> out. You know, because if I can't, if I feel like I'm playing underwater, I just start smashing, trying to mm -hmm. hear myself. And I, and then like, you know, 30 minutes into the set, I'm like, you know, panting or whatever. <laughs> if my chops aren't up, you know, or I'm just overdoing it. So that is a play? whole new thing now, like being on tour and everybody, including drummers going to in ears. It's like the reference is so clean that you don't like you're saying, you don't feel like there was some nights when the monitoring is so bad, even though you know you don't have to hit harder. You just do it because you, you feel so, like, it's like the, you know, like, I guess the scenario, like that dream where you're punching, but there's no power. It's like, or like you're saying, Elliot, like like you're trying to hit underwater. Like, yeah, no yeah. matter how hard I hit this, I don't feel or, or sense any sound being produced. Yeah, no matter how, how hard you hit, it's not going to happen. So. Yeah, oh, it's a yeah. horrible, very, very deflating feeling when you're in a yeah. live situation like that. So I can only imagine how glorious Indians are. It's so glorious, man. <laughs> really glorious. A lot of bands now don't even use any wedges at all on the no, no, none. Just no, yeah, silent stage. Yeah. yeah. 
even some drummers, most drummers, they either have the subwoofer in the seat now for the extra low end, or the drivers in in ears are so fantastic now. Yeah, they are. I'm using the butt kicker, the uh, the porters and Davies, like butt kicker in the in the throne. Uh huh. That that mixed with the in ears live is like it's killer because right? then it's still. Yeah, you know, I just I put the you I know, put the Will kick Hunt, in there, right? and I put the uh, a little bit of floor tom I put in it, and mm -hmm. uh, and the kick. Yeah, and then that's it. Yeah, yeah. I was I, when I did the years ago. I did a, a, that drum tech for BLS, and uh, Will Hunt was on tour with the other band, and I sat on his throne because he was like, "Dude, if you've never felt this low end thing, you got to sit on my throne and feel it." And it was crazy. I hit his kick drum and like the amount of low end response into those things in the throne. It's, it's insane. No. It's better than, you know, trying to rely upon a subwoofer with your blasting. Wedding. Yeah. Yeah. Like the, the subwoofer is not even close to what this thing did. It was so much better felt. It was crazy. Yeah. I, I hopped on uh, Mario Duplantier's kit when we were on tour with them. He's like, yo, check this out. And I, I sat down. I was like, got to have it. Yeah. So you're, you're doing it live now too, not just for the studio. I do it everywhere. I got it on my heat kit here in the house. I got it in fucking rehearsal space. I got it on tour. It's like I can't live without it. It's like my my setup, you know. I remember the first. I think the first one that came out was Pearl. I thought it was called the Butt Kicker from from Pearl way back eight yeah, yeah. years ago. You would attach end. that. You would attach that to an existing throne. You know. Yeah. What I mean? Yes, yeah, that's yeah. what yeah. he had. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. So you said you didn't record to a click. That's mind blowing to me. Who me? Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't play to a click ever, really. Yeah, I mean it's. But you have pre-production guitar track in your ear anyway, which was right, right. So what we'll click. do is we'll do the pre-production with drum machine uh, to a click. Sure. All of it, and then we'll play a live version of it in the studio. So even when I'm in the studio, we'll have the uh, we'll have a session up on on a screen in there, and just do a review. And I may actually even play along to the guitars on the pre-pro for a few minutes, like just to get the part. And then we turn off the pre-pro and me and Greg, you know, he plays a scratch guitar and we do it live. With no pre-prod in your ear. With nothing in my ear except for the, for and me and, and, and the guitar. And he's not yeah. playing along to a click either at that particular no. time? No, <laughs> Like God. Yeah. There's no, and that gives it kind of like way. a little bit of elasticity. You know, it's not much, but it's like, you can't lock a car bomb song to a grid. I was going like, to say, the way you yeah. guys glitch time, yeah, it's almost like you just you can't do it with a click. And it's it all it's all frustrating very right? to work to a click than to just play it in the air. Yeah, I wouldn't wouldn't want it. Plus, like the the it's just it kills kills it for me. Like the the joy of playing, you know what I mean? Because uh, I everybody's using a click nowadays, and it's like I'll, I'll I've hopped on like Garska has got this in ear mix. I listen to his in ear mix, and it's just like. The click is so loud and it's like the loudest thing. Like I was like, how can you, and he's killing it every night and he's playing super musically, but it's fucking like, I'm like, that would drive me crazy. Yeah. Well, let me but, throw uh, this question up here from Ash. I'm glad you joined us, sir. Thank you. So here's a question for both of you. Whoever wants to go first, feel free. Um, so in retrospect, what we we're just talking about, what percentage of you guys playing, I'll just pop it up here. <clears throat> what percentage of your playing when you first started still exists or informs your drumming today? Um, do you feel completely separate separate from your beginnings? Hmm. I'm sorry I missed that right when it came in because it probably would have made more sense in context. <laughs> well, I'm trying to. I'm trying to. You know, like I think. I think the one thing I will say from the beginning that has always been there is the like you know that that feeling here that that confident you know um uncompromised feeling here that i knew yeah when i started that i'm gonna i this will never end i'm gonna do this for the rest of my life that i could definitely you know uh sorry what like i even play oh. what i play though i don't know you know or do you I feel mean, or do you feel you're still building on your early years was the second part of that question well, I mean, to this day, and, and you know, there's still going to be an opportunity to play a straightforward drum beat, you know, but now you play it like you've been playing it forever as opposed to learning it. You know, it's there's a, an authority and a confidence that comes from it. But I don't think any of that exists. Like how we progress is 
basically rooted to how we began, if that makes sense. You know, so if we're rooted in, in a strong, confident, lifelong commitment and passion, then that will carry with us. But if we come in, you know, a little more mysterious or questionable, who knows, then I don't, I don't know how I, that would relate. Me personally, though, like when I first started playing, it was like, oh, I need to do this, you know. So, yeah, you've still, always had that fire. Still with me. I'm 52 and I still do this. Maybe I'm freaking crazy. I, maybe I should stop already, you know, but you can't. Yeah. That's what You're I'm one of those you drummers. It just, it just keeps going and going. When you hit the drums, you fucking mean it and you always have. It's never like halfway. There's never halfway bullshit going on. Just like watching you play for forever. You know what I mean? It's like. Holy shit! This guy's playing the fuck out of the drums, and that, that hasn't got away. You know, I think no. you know one thing I learned about uh, from an analytical perspective over the years is that that's how you tell the difference between someone who's in that like level of professional performance game and someone who's kind of more on the recreational side. Like a, a real professional, it doesn't matter what genre it is. When you watch them play drums, guitar everything is played with such a an authority and confidence over it it's it's back to that print like when you've done something so much then even in your most lackadaisical you know expression you still look completely confident and and authoritative in what you do it's you know elliot how long are you playing for been playing for 30 years over 30 years That's what I'm saying. i mean you don't yeah. even have to think about it at this point you could just get behind a drum set and be authoritative you know you've got 30 years behind you yeah and my, i i love what i love doing like even on the car bomb recordings and all the time is i just i i give shout outs to like my influences like in songs mm. you know I'll, I'll play drum fills from like old confessor records or i'll play lombardo fills oh or, like even lombardo on the is all over like yeah that's an even it, a good reference that you're saying right there. Like maybe not yeah. myself, but I could still hear influences from when I was growing up still bleeding into my playing today. Like you just said. On the new car bomb record, I just finished tracking. I fucking, uh, I put in a shorter straw fill. So I threw one of those in there. I mean, it's totally out of context, but yeah. Elliot, anything to add to that? Excellent answer from Ken on uh, what Ash was talking about, you know, going back to your beginnings till, till now, you know, in the, uh, in the differences or whatever. I mean, I find myself going back to the early stuff because the, the car bomb stuff is, is so metal. Like even like on the last car bomb record, we were, you know, doing like, uh, you know, odes to Metallica, like, like all kinds of like throwing in all kinds of stuff that we grew up on. You know what I mean? So it's uh, it's definitely a, a cumulative uh, thing for me. It just keeps building. It you you have a bunch of shit in the tank. You know what I mean? That you can kind of like pull it out randomly, and it's so it's so much fun to have like when uh, you have a repertoire of licks and drum beats and influences and this type of stuff. It makes it you know for a much more like eclectic you know playing experience or musical experience. You know what I mean? It's like taking That's all like, these things that you learn, you just compound onto each other. And you're like, okay, I totally. want to do this here. I want to do this here. It's all just from doing it. True. Yeah. And there it is because I said, I asked because Elliot's been fantastic for so long. I'm wondering how much of it still exists from then. Yeah, you are correct there on that, Mr. Pearson. <clears throat> fantastic. <laughs> if I didn't want to offend anybody, I would say that Elliot's my favorite drummer. But Elliot is amazing. Oh, oh come on, guys. <laughs> I just want to play metal in between working. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. Oh, no, dude. You're humble. What are you going to do? But uh, both nothing worse, nothing worse than some cocky fucking dickhead drummer. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me take another uh, brief break here. Um, I know Ken, uh, in fact, I'm sorry. Excuse me, I deleted some notes. Um, we're going to go into a little bit more about gear a little bit later on, but I'm just going to take a break here and throw up this uh, spot from Tama. And I know that, Ken, you play Tama still, and um, <coughs> Tama, so let me, I know it's not you with your Brady's. 
Tama guy. All right, we'll be right back. Love the Tama. 30 seconds. Hold tight. So, All right, sorry. while we were talking about Tama, <clears throat> why don't you go ahead and tell me a little bit about what you got going on with your setup right now? Uh, uh, right now, right now, um, I just finished actually tracking the last three songs for my album. Um, I have a project that I've been doing the last couple of years, writing an album. It's called Sensory Deception. So for that, I was kind of doing everything from a four-piece kit like Pandaria to um, kind of alternate toms, like an 8-inch or a 10-inch, and kind of incorporating that into some of the drum fills. Um, but for the most part, over the last couple of years, I bought a new drum set, a Kapoor drum set. It's, it's a full kit at this point. I have an 8-inch, a 10-inch, a 12-inch. I have a 14 and a 16 and an 18 floor tom. But the 14, I go between using it as a rack tom. Even the 16 recently, last week for two recording sessions, I actually used the 16-inch as a rack tom and used the 18 as a floor tom. So it's cool to have, you know, a nice spectrum of drum sizes to work with. But generally, I mean, I'm, I'm mostly like I work with a four-piece. And then from there, I think that... You know, it's like the same thing as, as any other instrument. There's got to be some kind of foundational, you know, specification that you prefer or, or generally work with. To me, it's a four piece. Um, back in the day growing up, it was definitely like the standard was more of a five piece, two rack toms. But um, definitely over the last couple of decades, the standard layout for a lot of new drummers is more of a four piece. I could be wrong in that. Maybe the, the culture is changing again. But generally, I'll start off with a four-piece, and if I need to add more to that, I will. Symbols, you know, decades now using Peisty and always love them. I do, you know, I, I, as, a, as a musician or even as a, as a recording drummer, I'm not, you know, like even though I'm endorsed by certain brands, the sound and the, and the, 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 um, the texture of music is a very unique thing, and each song is going to call for its own thing. And even in these last three songs I did for Sensory Deception, I actually used a Ludwig kick drum. And we used three Ludwig snare drums for uh, an overdub. I used a whole set of Ludwig toms for an overdub section. Even though the bass of the drums were, were my tom is, I, I don't mind going to other avenues of, of sonic exploration when you're, when you're creating music to be recorded. Um, I think live or, you know, generally what you personally prefer is important. I don't think it's, uh, it's tough to, to get into this discussion because it could go in so many tangents because as a drummer, say you're in a heavy metal band and you just want to be in that band and you just want to have that sound, you know, you're just going to lock into something you like for that. But I'm like, I'm an engineer, I'm a producer, I'm a songwriter, so it's like, I like every single thing. I like all drums, all sizes, all cymbal. You know, I like it all. I use all different types of drumsticks, heads, whatever you need for the sonic environment you're a part of. So that's how I am. I'm, I'm endorsed, but I'm also completely open to everything. Sure, sure. And you're still playing Promark sticks, right? Endorsing? Promark, thankfully, I got back to them. You know, I, I used them as a kid. Then um, I got on to, to Vic Firth through uh, Marco Sicoli. I don't know if you know who Marco is. He's like an amazing dude. He's pretty much, I think, I thought everybody in the drumming world knows who Marco Sicoli is. But if you don't, he's basically, uh, he was a professional drummer. But then he got into uh, artist representation working for Vic Firth. Got me on the roster, which was great. But then he moved over to D'Addario, which was Evans and Promark and uh got me onto there and i was happy about that i've been you know i was a little bit unsure about vic firth so getting over to promark i was a lot happier overall the the stick integrity is a little bit better nice i will say this though they they got rid of the 2s which was the hickory the the big fat hickory stick that i was using 
So now I'm using Tommy Aldridge's stick. It's, it's the same stick, but it's made out of shirakashi oak. And that wood is a little more drier, a little bit harder. It's not as soft and dense. So when I hit it, I break those sticks a little bit easier than the hickories. <laughs> so what are you going to do? What are you <laughs> What are you, you going to do, man? What are you playing from pure sound, like snare wires or something else? Or? Yeah, um, that's inter that's an interesting story because years and years ago, um, when they first came out, they boasted about their integrity. That was their big selling point when they first came out. And um, we were on tour. Dude, I was breaking like a snare to two, you know, one to three individual wires a night on tour. So it's like every week I'm changing out an actual snare wire. So we came home from tour, we're off tour, and I happened to see the ad for them. And so I went and bought them. And bro, I'm serious. On the next tour, they didn't break the whole tour. The whole the whole tour went and not one even individual wire broke off. And I was like, now that is massive. Because at the time, I don't know what snare wires, you know, are now, but the Thomas snare wires at the time were like 15 bucks each. So it's like, you know, it may not sound like a lot, but you're spending 75 to 80 bucks a tour just for snare wires. So to buy one at, it was like 25 bucks for the blasters. So it was a little more money, you know, for one, but it lasted the whole tour. So it saved me 60, 80 bucks in the long term. Hmm. Nice. So that was awesome when, when D. Dario acquired Pure Sound as well. I was like, Psh, you could just crazy. hit lighter. I could just hit lighter. <laughs> like Ellie was saying earlier with your friggin' stick height pointing like the Statue of Liberty, man. I'm just making so it hard. hard. <laughs> so hard. But... Oh, man. Well, it's not really just that. It's scientifically speaking, it's it's just the, the point of acceleration of velocity. So from here to here, how fast do I want to go there? So the faster I throw the stick there, added with the, the bigger the stick, yeah, it's just gonna create more mass and energy at impact. And you, the way you pull you pull the stroke out of the drums, you know what I mean? Like, I, I I know guys who play super hard that that they choke the drum out. You know what I mean? But you're like the opposite of that. It's like the well, the what shells. I do is is I I basically like it's more of a, a fighter mindset. So my objective is to play through the drum. <laughs> Like as if you're striking, when you're striking in a fight, you strike through yeah, yeah. your opponent's impact point. And then whatever the impact is will dictate how you then respond after that. So what I do is I hit with the intent to go through the drum, but it's like I brace for impact right at the very last minute before impact. And then as soon as I make impact, I it release pop, pops up. my tension so the stick comes off. So it's like it's, no, it's killer. Yeah. And so I, I'm maximizing the amount of acceleration of velocity. So I'm getting the maximum amount of speed into the head by releasing it as late as possible. So I, I actually filmed it once in slow motion and I'm literally like this close to the rim of the drum before the actual stroke snapped over. So there's nice. so much speed at that point that when the stick finally snaps over, it's bringing that much more energy into the hit. And then by using a big fat drumstick, that just makes it destructive. I mean, I'll be <laughs> the first one to tell you those sticks are destructive. They are. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, I even tried to play a little bit of a lighter stick for a couple of years, and it actually, I, I, I just couldn't get used to it. It's hard to get used to when they're snapping apart. Well, it's just a matter of what you're, <laughs> the amount of energy you're throwing. So I needed to find a stick that would match that. And the heaviest stick is the way to go. I mean, I play jazz. I'll use a light drumstick to play jazz. But for the heavy music, I, I need those, those Tommy Aldridge sticks, man. Tommy Aldridge fucking rules, dude. Bro, did you see that latest Drumio <laughs> video with him? Fucking amazing. 72, amazing. I think. Oh, if I'm playing drums like that at 72, holy cow. That's 20 years from now. I feel like yeah. 20 years from now, I'm going to be like, yeah, you know, I don't know. 
that was like one of the first VHS cassettes I got was Tommy Aldridge, his his lesson video in the 80s DCI, whatever. Oh, yeah, out. yeah. What a yeah. great video that was, man. He's trying to show you how to twirl the sticks, too. And he's like, <laughs> oh, my God, it's so good. Was it, was it the one where he's doing the fives with his hands? Yeah, he's playing. He plays with his hands. He, yeah. He's doing <laughs> – he's going nuts. Yeah, here's one for you, Ken. Oh, I'm sorry. That's the wrong one. How long did a, a snare head usually last you on a tour with that – power and nasty stick <laughs> very interesting question well there was a point in time where it got it got better but before like okay so with evans i use what if i was on tour with evans i would use uh marco's head it's called the heavyweight and that's a really thick head that head kind of emulates what um remo came out with in the 90s called the emperor x which was a two ply, but they put a black dot in between the two plies. So it made the center of the head really durable. So before the Emperor X, I was messing up Emperors about every two shows I, I had to change. With the Emperor X, I was getting a full week of shows before it would start to dud out. Um, I could push it a little further, but the coating was getting worn and just, it was like, I'm on tour. I want to you know, have, you know, that's the thing. It's like when you're on tour, you're performing for other people. If there's an audience there, it's like my job isn't just to play and look cool playing and play the parts right, but the sound's got to be right too. So it's like, you know, even if they. Oh. Well, there he goes. <laughs> Sorry, phone call came in. Ah. So if even if the head's not broken, if it's starting to dull out, you got to change the head so that you could give the audience the maximum potential sound. So that was OK. The Emperor X definitely helped out a lot longer. I'd say I probably got a good five or six gigs out of those before I'd want to change them. Tom heads. Uh, yeah, about three to four gigs. And then I changed Tom heads. Not that much. Kick drum heads all tour. You know, they wouldn't break. Back in the day before the little kick pads, they they were definitely more vulnerable. But once those kick pads came out, then those those helped out a lot. Because using a, a plastic beater definitely is pretty abusive. You gotta have that extra little little kick pad in the in the middle there. Sure, sure. I just recently started using those Danmark click pads again. Remember yeah, those yeah. things? Oh yep. yeah. I, I was like, I missed it so much that I, I bought a couple, some of those trick aluminum beaters, and I, I, I'm using that with the click pad. It just sounds like what, it's. What's actually in those things? Is it metal in there? No, I, it's like some kind of uh, some composite fiber. It just it's like the air around the disc that makes it click, and then ah. when, once once that cracks out, then it loses the click and it's useless. But uh, oh, so you have to swap them out. But I, I remember using those as a kid, and I just, I, I just for some reason I was like, Do they still make those, and I've been using those for like the last year or two again. Ah, yeah. all right. So in the oh. beginning of the interview, when we talked about early influences who made you want to drum, Lars was one of your answers. And I've heard stories about this in the past, and I don't know if it's true or not. Um, but you're talking about that click. Have you ever tried to tape like pennies or nickels before? I these? did that. Dude, yeah, did you ever try Yeah, that? we heard about that because, and uh, there was a recording I did with my band in the 80s, Attica was the band. And one of the demos we did, we went in and I taped silver dollars to the kick drums where the beaters were. Yeah. Yeah. I'm pretty I sure did. they did some of that on uh, Master of Puppets, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I don't remember where we heard it from exactly, but I remember hearing that. I forgot. I think somebody said it was Lars Ulrich that did it. It might have been they Damage put. Incorporated. I have to look yeah. it up. Oh, well, Pantera, Pantera popularized that that sound, you know, with the the fifty cent piece. With uh, you take two drum heads and you, you just cut it, and then you make like your own patch, and you put the the fifty cent piece in the middle, and then you you basically duct tape that to the head, and you use uh -huh. a wood beater, use a wood beater on it, and it's just like tick tick tick. Yeah, and then yeah. you make. I had a wood beater with the the the, the half dollar, and we used. Uh, duct tape over it just to yeah, duct tape yeah. the, the coin to the to the head and and then when the duct tape glue would start making your you know beater start sticking <laughs> yeah. to the drum 
and you'd have to refresh it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. After that first experience with the glue, I was like, okay, this is obviously mechanically off. I'm not doing Yeah. That. Yeah. Well, I'm Vinny was also a uh, rest in peace again. Uh, there's a lot of rest in peace tonight. That's, but Vinny was one of the bit first bigger guys to get behind Dan Mar. Oh man. Really? Oh, yeah. yeah. So while Dan Mar and uh, Remo, right? Remo drums, he was playing like on the, those first couple of records, right? Yeah, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about a little bit of gear with you, Elliot. Um, and I'm just going to open it up with a question here. That's a um, pretty cool question. Then we'll talk a little bit about more about what you're playing right now. But I'm interested to hear the answer to this uh, from Curtis. When are we going to talk about Elliot's badass Yamaha kit and why he chooses a brass piccolo snare? Mm. And why you're not a Yamaha artist yet? <laughs> He a- he asked all the questions I was gonna ask him. Oh man, <laughs> Curtis, you blew you blew Ken's train of thought there for no, us. That's and- awesome. That's great. <laughs> I've been trying to get a Yamaha endorsement for like fifteen years. I I I almost got a rep and like alone to just talk to them, and uh, it, it was like Car Bomb is not a good band name. That was the, uh, the I think it was closer to nine eleven at the time or whatever. But you know, I think oh, the last time I. Man. The last, the last time I tried, I was like, fuck it. I, I own so many Yamaha drums. Like, you know, the only reason I would need help from them is like went touring overseas or, you know, but, um, I just like collect Yamaha drums. I got to, it's, I, it's a sickness, but, was um, there a drummer yeah. that turned you on to Yamaha? So I wanted to be fucking Dave Weckl and Vinny Caliuta. You know what I mean? The, I was there like such go. a, so my, my yeah. drum kit is essentially like the Weckl drum kit from you know he was playing with like uh electric band mm-hmm. with an extra extra bass drum and bigger floor toms so it's like 220 by 18s uh 8 10 15 18 yeah. wow so it's it's like big size uh differences between the toms so when i go across i tune them really low too that's like a thoroughly weckle thing too like small drums tune low mm. um and they just cut, they cut through like everything. Yeah. 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 I love, I love those drums. So they're, they're like late eighties, uh, recording customs. Oh, so they're and maple. Birch. Birch. All the recording, the recording customs are birch. birch. I thought the recording yeah. customs were maple. Ah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, the birch is like super, super, the attack is, is nice. I'm guessing and you were a Will Calhoun fan as well. Will Calhoun? Yeah. yeah, I mean, Louis Color is great. He wasn't like a main influence on me, but he's a great fucking player. No, I just thought he played yeah. Yamahas. I thought he'd be one of your, uh, your Yamahas. I, think, I don't think they were Yamaha. I think he had a yellow... Uh, it was a Gretsch. He had the yellow Gretsch, but I thought he played Yamaha before yeah. Gretsch. Um, so what yeah, about... What about your? You still have your... Obviously, you're not going to get rid of it. You're still playing your Brady kits on, on the road, or are you not? So I'm like in between studios and apartments, so my, my Brady kit's just in cases in a storage place. Like It's a real tragic tragedy, you know, along with a bunch of my other drums. So I'm uh, I'm in the process of trying to get like a room where I can... I have a re- rehearsal room with the band. Hey, Ken, he's in the process of self-development right now. Yeah. Process of square footage <laughs> development. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard in, in the city, so um, yeah, I can't bring all my drums into the rehearsal space because it's just too much, and all the guys will yell at me. You know, that's band band stuff. So I just have the one car bomb kit in there, and the V kit here at the house. But um, yeah, I got tons of drums. I wish I, I, that's my goal is to get like a drum room where I can set up a, the Brady kit, ideally. You know, and and the same have, thing you got going on. Do you have uh, your own um, drum samples for your V kit, or do you use other samples? No, no. I just use I use the V kit as like a writing tool more than anything else. So I'm not. I don't. But really do you get put rough. your own drum sounds in them as the? No, no. That, like this TD50, uh, they got a, a they call it the Jara kit, but it is a Brady kit. Uh huh. And it sounds unbelievable. Wow, it's that's like, awesome. Yeah, yeah. It's a uh, I'm like you can't see it here. I got my. I'm actually resting my foot on the floor tom of. Uh, yeah. I've been lucky. <laughs> and, I've been lucky enough to play and see a lot of different drums going to Nam for for 14 years or whatever it was, and still to this day, the drum I've hit that sounded the best and felt the best was a Brady floor tom. Hmm. They're I mean, unbelievable. It's just, drums. You don't need a drum thumper. It, 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 you know what I'm talking about? Well, I don't, but 
I don't play on a stage in front of thousands of people either, but just, just the, I made Derek Roddy come over and hit it. I made Bittner come hit it. I made Forrest Rob, I made all these guys come hit it just to sit in the throne and hit this floor time they had on display. Just, mm-hmm. you could feel it just coming up through the floor, vibrating your wow. clothes and I couldn't get enough of it. I kept going back like through the whole, you know, week or weekend. Sure. I was, I'd stop every time I was near it just to hit it again. <laughs> those, those, it's a shame they went out of business, man. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Great job. I have like seven or eight, maybe even more snare drums, Brady snare drums too. I, I had like a while, a while where I was just fucking like acquiring Brady shit. It's just cause I was, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it sounds so good. Oh, um, there's nothing yeah. like it. Nothing. Yeah. I mean, I can't say that. Like, I'm, a, you know, we advertise for lots of different companies and there's lots of great drums. There's lots of great Thomas. There's lots of great everything, but you know, taste and preference for me, that Brady. Yeah. But I don't take any of that shit on tour. Nastiest shit I've ever hit. Yeah. I don't take any of the drums on tour. Yeah. You used to though, which I thought was crazy. I never took the Brady's out. No. I swear you told me you took Brady's out. Maybe snare drum. Okay. Yeah. Snare drum a couple of times. Yeah. Not that. What else do you play? You still playing Zildjian? Of course. Zildjian. Yeah. I'm a big Zildjian fucking, uh, I was even before I was endorsed, I had a, Zildjian sickness. And yeah. how long have you been endorsed with them? Um, not too long, like 2017, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Now, 2018. It's funny that you said that. Well, not funny. It's it's shocking because Zildjian, to me, they're a great company to work with. Um, but it, it seems a lot harder for guys in death metal to get endorsement with them. And I don't know if it's for a similar reason that you experienced with Yamaha. That's interesting to me. Well, potentially, yeah. I mean... But you're, I mean, metal guys always have. I mean, wait, even if it's like uh, the gospel chop shit, or it's like everybody's got a ton of symbols now. So it's like the metal guys, like it's like if you want to sell twenty symbols, like endorse a metal guy because he's got the wall of symbols. You know what I mean? So <laughs> they're in Seska but, setup. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I definitely, I definitely have a wall of symbols. Yeah, the Zildjian shit. I I have a lot of like collectible Zildjian stuff that I would never use on the on the car bomb stuff that I, w- I would just go right through but i'm you know at heart i'm like a fusion guy you know what i mean and I, I don't play that hard when i'm playing that stuff so i would love to do a project where where i can bust that stuff out and uh you know but for the car bomb stuff i'm using a, a nice selection of their their newer stuff they they released this line called sweet k yeah, so yeah. they had mm. yeah they had sweet a uh, sweet rides and then they created this thing called Sweet K, which is like, uh, I don't know what alloy they're using, but the, the crashes sound unbelievable. I'm also using a ride, 23-inch Sweet K ride. That kind of just, it just, on so a lot of the newer car bomb stuff, there's sections where you, I just lay into the ride as a crash and just kind of fill out the whole the whole tune, you know? And that thing is just like, uh, that's like a thoroughly Deftones thing that car bombs mm. kind of incorporated, you know? Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, I love, that. I love that ride. You still got that ride I sent you back years back where you did the uh, review and kept it? Yes, the, all the A stuff. I got that. I, yeah. Dude. I want, want it them? back. Dude, <laughs> I got it for you. <laughs> I'm just kidding. And how long – you still play your Vic Firth still, right? How long have you been with Vic Firth? Same time because they yeah. got acquired. Uh, Zildjian and Vic Firth are now the same company, so I got endorsed uh, by them. I, and I just happened to be using Vic Firth at the same time. So I could know, do this they, and it wouldn't even matter anymore because I could just go back and do that, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, what I was Vic I use Vic, Vic first. Uh, so it's like uh, extreme five B. Oh yeah. So it's like a it's like a five B, but a little bit longer. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And they're they're great. I just like the balance on it, just it being a little bit longer. I can get the whip. I would use I would use larger sticks, but I I go through symbols. I'm more, also more comfortable using a larger stick, just for technique wise and just rebound wise. But uh, I just go through symbols too fast. Yeah. With the bigger sticks. Yeah, I, I literally like a China will ask me a couple of gigs if I was using like a two B or something like that. It would mm-hmm. would be pretty be a fucking yeah. massacre. Yeah, symbols are a tough world. If you go for a softer symbol, it may not crack as easy, but it'll dent. Right. And if you go for the harder symbol, it won't dent, but it may crack easier. So it's like, and you know what saved my symbols is the in ears. You know, is, ah. is saved. Yeah, like and you, that, you that's... said you use overheads, right? Yeah. That yeah. helps too. That helps. Yeah. When we go out, we have like our own sound package that we use. So I'm like, I got, I got mics on both hats. I got mics overheads. Everything's nice. close mic so I can get, nothing is too, uh, 
you know, I don't have to hit anything too loud to hear it. Nice. Yeah, it's like nice, nice. So I think the hardest part it's like it's it's more the music, you know. Like I think one thing I always like like I learned from Randy Castillo. I had a very good piece of wisdom given to me before I ever even started touring. Randy and Castillo. Randy Castillo. Yeah, he did a modern drum. That drum solo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He did an interview when he got the tour with Ozzy in Modern Drummer, and he had talked about how he was so excited when he first started touring that he would almost overstep his energy. He'd be so excited at the beginning of the show that he would almost feel himself getting winded early. So we learned how to like start the show off a little more moderately and efficiently and build his energy up throughout the show so that he was never you know, wasted or winded too early. So I use that, you know, going on tour, but it's so hard when you're playing for an audience like me personally, there's only so much reservation I can have before I know, like, as soon as you see that first mosh pit, it's it's almost like it's on. I can't help but play in that same level of energy with them. And it's not very respectful to my drums and cymbals, but it's like, to me, the, the sacrifice that I make on the on the equipment is worth it to play as the energy of the audience. So, oh yeah, I'm the same it's way. I just, though. I just overdo it, you know. Yeah, I once mean, I it's see. Tough. It. Sorry, you were saying I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, it's all good. I don't. What was I saying? I can't even remember. <laughs> well, we're just kind of like yeah, that's the whole thing. Trying to, it's hard to fight, and that, you know, we're part of a certain energy. If you're playing jazz. You know, your your overall interactive energy with the audience will be different if you're playing disco, R&B. The energy is always going to be different from an interactive perspective. It's like, how could I, like, literally, like, you've played the Trocadero, right, Elliot? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, bet. stages like that, when you're in a place where you're visually on this angle where you could see out into that main floor of the audience, I mean, bro, I mean... <sighs> <laughs> when the floor lights up, it's like if you're not engulfed in that same energy as the drummer, it's like I don't know. Yeah, I don't fuck know yeah. What, I, me personally, it's just like I just lose it. It was just insane. I love playing live. I love fucking seeing people going off it. I feed off that. And yeah, yeah, man. That's oh, the thing God. about car bomb too. Like even like not playing with a click or any of that type of stuff. Like the 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 energy is like. I love I love seeing other bands too, where it's like got the fire. You know what I mean? Where it's like there's no denying it. There's not nothing sterile about it. You know what I mean? You're just like, mm -hmm. yeah, Candiri was like that too. It's just like undeniable fucking energy, like just coming off the stage. You know, fucking sick. I can't believe yeah. you guys don't. I, I still can't believe you don't play to a click or record to a click, especially because that video you did not that long ago it was a black and white one that you sent to me. Where oh, the one at Hellfest? The Hellfest, where you didn't have... Yeah. yeah. You're right. You recorded that on the side of you with a cell phone or something. Yeah. And then later on, you found another video online that you used from the, the front of house. And took your audio and took the video and matched them up, and they matched pretty perfect. Well, it was the same performance. I know, of course, but yeah. it's crazy that you, <laughs> that you don't play to a click. I, I don't... Car Bomb's music is so... Um, well, when I was growing up, clear wasn't a thing. Theater, you, know, wasn't, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's the, the changes and the, how tight you. Everyone I play car bomb for that's never heard of you. That's the first thing they'll say is, "Holy shit, these guys are so tight, man! How do you do that? How do you remember all that? And how do you play that tight?" And if I would have known and realized that there was no click going on at that time, they might have just shit themselves. <laughs> No, people are interested in the no click thing. They're just like they just can't believe it. I'm all these for it because you know? yeah. I think it brings a level of feel to the music that gets lost when a lot of guys, you know, go too well, serious on charting or clicking. But, all the guys in the band were all '90s maybe. You know what I mean? So yeah. it's like the click wasn't a thing unless you were playing something with like electronic. You know, yeah. I used to play in Spooge. I used to manually turn the loops on and off. Like I had a sampler, and I would turn the loops on and off with a, a cat pad I had. It'd be like start the loop, end the loop, you know. So even then, it wasn't like any backing tracks because there was no laptops. You yeah. know what I mean? Mm. So that's how I got around it back then. And now, the car bomb that even the kit that I'm using now, it's like a very honed in thing where car bomb has got a sound now. You know what I mean? And that kit is like the sound of the band. 
mm. you know, along with the, the guitar tone that, and the effects that hey, Greg going is doing. Back so. to that, that, that guy asked, because that was part of my question too, the, uh, the Yamaha piccolo snare drum. Is that the car bomb snare sound? It has become that, yeah. So uh, well, the last was, three was that records. on the first album as well, or was that a different one? No, I was using the Brady on the first one. Okay, <laughs> it's like much ring, much you know, a lot ringier. But the crack is, uh, you know, it's it's a great snare drum. But like for the um, yeah, for the last couple of records and always live, I've been using that. Uh, what is it? SD four nine three. It's a three and a half inch brass with uh, die cast hoops, and it's got the. Um, the parallel strainers on it so i can dial in the height of the yeah. strainer yeah and i use a pure sounds um you know I, I 25 strand i think like a thicker thicker uh i know there's a snare. 24 there's a 24 strand it's wider than the the normal one so yeah it, uh -huh. it, yeah and that i can really dial in the ghosts really come across yeah yeah on that snare drum you know because like when i'm a, playing it that snare drum like claimed its fame in the 90s man like a lot it's of the, it's the snare drum the that uh, it's the snare drum that Vinny Caliuta was playing on that uh, Gad Weckl Caliuta battle. Was he using you the piccolo that? on that? That it's was the it? same snare drum. You mean uh, a battle, or though you talking about when there was also Gad up in that mix? Uh, yeah, it's the three of them on the stage at Zildjian yeah. Day. Yeah, yeah, dude. Yeah, Vinny's doing that. Da, 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 go 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 go. <laughs> All that shit. Yeah, one of my favorites. That's, it's that snare drum. Yeah, I just want to be Vinny. So if I can play that snare drum all the time, I'm, I'll be good. Vinny Hoffman. <laughs> What's that, Dave? Vinny Hoffman. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, I knew Vinny was one of your faves. Who, 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 who yeah. isn't he? If, you know, those those three guys. It's like you know, it's going. It's like when King Crimson did that tour, you know, last year with the with the three drummers. I amazing. I missed it because uh, I was. They did a tour with three drummers. Yeah. I have to look up the names. Yeah, Harrison. It was Harrison and Massalato and what uh, was, it was, right? it was. But it was insane. I heard, but uh, I didn't get to see it because it didn't come anywhere near me. Oh wow! Because Harrison, of course, he's one of my new faves. He's been mm, around for a I love yeah. Porcupine Tree. I was actually, uh, I had a question. I didn't have a question, but they you, came out when we were doing our thing in the late 90s and our co-producer Mike Barilli he got into them and that first album he was like bro you got to hear this band and they were awesome that first album was really it was something very unique for the time yeah and they're I never record. really got into them as a fan but hearing that first album I was like these guys are great they've obviously they've grown into this amazing career I've never really followed them so I don't know the extent, the extents of their career and their songwriting, but that first album was pretty wild. Their latest album, Closure Continuation, is really wild. Mm. Um, you, you'd like them. You should check it out. Their main guy, you know, Stephen Wilson, he, he plays everything, everything. When you know, and they, the way they track their productions are just immaculate. Mm. And the, Gavin reminds me a lot of both of you guys in certain ways. One. His timing is crazy. I was, I was listening to a song um, called Herd Culling. It's from Closure Continuation, or as most people just abbreviate CC, you know, the CC record from Porcupine Tree. Um, there's a song on there called Herd Culling. And I was sitting there last night, and this is something that blows my mind again about Elliot. Whenever I ask Elliot a question about, hey, what time signature is this song in? Or if I can't figure it out, I'll just send him a link and be like, hey, what time signature is this in? Even one of my own songs, you know, because sometimes I write shit that I can't really explain. And I'd let him hear it for about three seconds. He's like, oh. And then he'll, you know, he'll clap it. He could chart it. He'll tell you what time signature's in, like, right away. And Gavin Harrison's the same way. And that, that song, Heard Calling, is an 11-8 for a lot of it. And he's just so relaxed and so pocket, yet flavorful and dynamic with his fills in 11-8. It's mind-blowing to me. And you guys both share that, that quality that you write so proficiently in odd time signatures, man. Um I don't Not know if that's a question, but <laughs> it's, uh, Gavin is on another level, um, but so are you guys in a different genre is what I guess I'm trying to say. Odd time signatures are an interesting thing because there are two kind of avenues to mess with them. You know, you could be very deliberate with them where you kind of like can tell not even if, you know, not counting it necessarily, but like, oh, that's off, you know, that like 
there's a deliberate intent to make something that sounds like it's not in 4-4. And then there's the other way, which is kind of like being more fluid with it. So giving the impression that, you know, you'll get the idea that there's something not 4-4 happening, but you're not triggered by something that's fragmented or anything. You're kind of more feeling circular. That's at least how, like, I took our timing, try to make it feel circular as opposed to square. Yeah, it's, it's, it's for me, it's kind of the same thing. Like, you have you have the cyclical type of stuff where it's, you have longer phrases of odd groupings or whatever that will go over straight time, mm-hmm. which is, like, the thoroughly, like, Mashuga thing. And then That's you what have, we did uh, a lot, too. Totally, yeah. C- Candaria was big on that. It's like, yeah. uh, you know you know, groupings of five or groupings of seven played over four and it just, you just, it, and then eventually it comes out on one and it hits, yeah. you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And then, um, and then you have stuff that's a little more chopped and staggered, you know, that is a little, little more jerky or whatever, you know? Well, you guys yeah. almost sound like, like you do like, like three, one, we, two, one, like, like. Well, we would try and do cycles over mix meter stuff. So it becomes like, but it, all of that is worked out in arrangement, like ahead of time. How do you, well, how do you like, like you subdivide so much between, you know, triplet and straight feel with a lot of that glitchy sounding stuff. So like, do you even bother trying to like break that into bars or it's just like this part's going to. Well, no, yeah, it's, like it's all arranged. Me and Greg, the guitarist, you know, we've kind of taken the rhythmic concept to like, you have your standard like fusion vocabulary of odd meter stuff and, and cyclical stuff. Mm-hmm. But we're trying to do that like in more um, like different rates. So normally it would be like if, if subdivided 16 or six tuplets, but we're doing it with like five tuplets or seven tuplets with like rests in it and shit. And it just changes the whole feel. Mm. And it's just an illusion of a lot of it's like an illusion of a quarter note pulse, but it's really like a five or a seven. Mm. And we leave, we leave a lot of rests in there. So you can't really tell what it is, you know? Um, no, that's the thing. Yeah. A lot of your, like, time-wise, like, from a time signature perspective, it, it sounds very suspended. You don't know, kind of, it's it's almost like, from my perspective, it's like, I'd rather enjoy just following along on the listening journey with you guys. Like, it's it's so deep, like, to sit back and be analytical and try and break yeah. it down into just time. Follow, it's just just like, follow the symbol, you it. know? <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. There isn't, because, you know, You've seen these guys out there doing those reaction videos and like that jazz metal, you know, not, not the jazz metal, jazz drummer reacts kind of shows on YouTube. Right, right. right and it's funny because I've seen a few different different people now. I think play uh, play a you know a, a car bomb track and they've, they've said the same thing. Um, where's one? <laughs> like, yeah. like what Ken saying these elongated parts, and he'd like to sit back and take the journey on it. But if you ever sat and tried to find one or what he's doing, if you tried to count these crazy measures out. Yeah, and Not for me, I don't count. Part. I don't count it past the first. After I learn it, I don't count it. You know what I mean? I, mm-hmm. If it's possible to feel it, you know, I, I guess I feel it. You know, or once I get the coordination down. But it's it. A big part of it is just taking that, like I said, like standard progressive metal slash progressive rock vocabulary, and just kind of taking that to the next uh, logical conclusion, and it just sounds. Sounds weird because it's not. If you if you hear like eighth note triplets or you hear your normal polyrhythms, you can internalize those because we've all heard those. You know what I mean? So my my big goal with car bomb is to try and write shit that you never hear or you haven't heard yet. It's like a non standard riff, and and that's the shit that like pops for me where it's like I, I want to hear riffs that I haven't heard before. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And that's another what kind of part of it is the guys you play with too right now. Monsters, they're all monsters, and you've been with them for a long time, and you're all crazy. 20 years, you guys are all working together, yeah, yeah. As a unit, we've been together 20 years, yeah. You'd have a hard time being able to pull off the shit you pull off if you had to have new guys jump in and out of that band. That wouldn't happen, it would be over. Anybody drops, it's over, and that's I think that's why you could even like, (laughs) no, it won't be over. the, the, The last two albums, like the amount of detail and and songwriting that you're implementing into each song now like the, your newer songs are so much more detailed there's so much more progressing along i watch and that's a big part of great it's it's the the song is only three it's like three minutes and 25 seconds but it was only two and a half minutes in and so much had already happened 
like you're, you're making so much more dense now like yeah you you can see how much you guys have grown and developed and intensified over the years it's pretty there's so much like shit jammed in there like information wise oh you know goodness. what i mean it's so dense it's so dense yeah most it's bars crazy. are you know most bars are different you know we hardly hardly repeat you know so yeah it's it's crazy yeah. It's crazy. Like, even that's within a section, wondering. each bar is different. Yeah. That's why, and that's why I was wondering. At certain points, it almost sounds like it's it's not, it's like a big giant piece of rhythmic structure as opposed to measures of music. You know? Yeah. Pretty crazy. Yeah, Greg, epic stuff. Greg is the really meticulous one. He's like he'll go. He's like way more I, he, as OCD as I am. He's, uh, you know, he just sits there and he'll he'll fucking. He's the he's the guy, you know what I mean. And I I just kind of like uh, I I throw ideas at him, and he'll he'll rework them in like ten different ways that I hadn't thought of when I threw him the original idea. Mm -hmm. You know, he just meticulously pulls it apart. So he's really like the producer of Car Bomb. You know what I mean? If they, mm -hmm. if it had to be said, you know. Okay. Just, but um, yeah, because we don't write together in a room anymore. So it's like me. I'll write a bunch of riffs. I'll send them to him and then he'll incorporate those ideas into shit that he's writing already or, you know, write a whole new song on an idea that I sent him, but it's ah. not, you know, so yeah. Yeah. And that's but the then, beauty of where we are today to be able to work remotely. You know, it's a wonderful thing. Yeah. And then for me, the song is not written until it's recorded because I'm improvising in the studio on all these sections. Oh, and shit. then once the, and then once the final comp is put together, I have to learn how to play that as a tune. You know what I That's mean? That's kind of how uh, Matt works too. In periphery. Garska? Oh yeah, no, Matt no. Periphery too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No he'll he'll, yeah. he'll, he'll like work out a lot of ideas in the studio, bring it all together, and then he's got to learn it. No, I was I was in for ten days doing this last car bomb record, and I fucking was playing like every eight bars. I would do like five keepers. Like I would do like three solid ones, and I'd do like two. Just go for it mm -hmm. once for every eight or 16 bars and then just do comp at the end. You put everything in playlist and then you just comp it all out. Yeah. And it just turns into this fucking musical piece that's like, you know, it would take me a year to learn how to play that all at once as a take. Right. But then I but then I have that final take and I'll play a version close to that live. You know what I mean? So and that's kind of how it's worked on the last two records, you know. Right on. Yeah. Yeah, uh -huh. and it turns out awesome. Yeah, it's even. You brought up yeah, Gartska yeah. too, though. I mean, a lot of like what Animals as Leaders did in the early stages when they bring the drummers in, they they were learning the songs, but being interpretive with what was kind of programmed as well. Totally. Yeah. yeah. Totally. Same thing with Carbon. Yeah. Especially now at this point, like the songs from the first album, I could only imagine Matt must be just like tripping all over him now, doing whatever the fuck he wants. I oh yeah, totally different versions. Totally different yeah. versions. Yeah. Well, every drummer that's played with animals is insane. You know what yeah, I mean? Levine is, Levine a... is sick. Yeah. I've that dude has gotten so insane. Oh yeah. my goodness. Oh, the new Anthios. <laughs> the new Anthios material is nar nasty. As my daughter yeah. would say, nasty. <laughs> hey, you just mentioned carb um, um, ten days. Does that mean you're done? I've been done. Yeah, I'm done. Okay. And then yeah. what's next? Obviously, yeah, all the all these other fuckers got to do all their stuff and everything. So, oh, so your yeah. your drums are first, and that's it. That's all that's done so far. Yeah, yeah. Or no, they're you know they're working on it. So we're shooting for fall, you know, for a release or something. You know, so cool. you're still releasing it yourself. Yeah. Yeah, nice. the pie. The pie is so small. You know what I mean? It's just like let's keep the whole pie. Yeah. You know, at this point, because we're getting the gigs kind of ourselves. So the benefit of uh, and we can't tour that much. So we're not really a benefit for a label because we can't tour that much. Mm. And um, you know, we're kind of like resigned ourselves to just doing it ourselves. You know, anything could happen on the next cycle or whatever. I mean, we kind of built it up, but it's uh, we're at the point now. Sorry. where the band is paying for itself, you know, which is a miracle. So let's, let's just like keep that going. <laughs> yeah. 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 Are you engineering you self -sustaining this yourself? business going? Yeah. Are you engineering this one yourself? No, no, we have the last couple, we've had a couple of other guys doing it. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Yeah. We, yeah. We'll, we'll farm it out to a couple of people and get test mixes back. And we have a couple of guys in mind. But that, when you uh, actually sat down and tracked, was it, it was acoustic drums? 
Oh yeah, yeah. The Yamahas. Oh, yep, the Yamahas yeah. with the Yamaha snare. Yeah. And was it Where in you New York? At uh, Silvercord Studios, the Gojira Studio over there. Silvercord. Yeah. Now, can I talk about that a little or no? Yeah, yeah. Are you still or ever were? I thought you were part owner. So I was a partner in there. I, I built out a whole room over there, and then when the pandemic hit. I kind of pulled out as a partner in uh, the, so the recording studio business, but it's I'm I'm still doing all my recording there. Which it's all love over there still, so it wasn't like uh, yeah, yeah. It's, but I'm not. It's not my business. I still try and throw session work over there whenever you know people inquire about recording because they got. Oh, so it's a working studio because it's open and working. Studio. And that's in Brooklyn. It's in Brooklyn, yeah, in Bushwick. Yeah, great sounds. They just got a new SSL console over there. A bunch of neat stuff and. They're, they're doing sessions in there all the time. So, Did you help design great. the room and the audio facade of the place <sighs> as well? They had the, the live room and the A room built already. And then I built like a B room upstairs, which is like a mixed master suite. But now that's turned into like a uh, more like a vocal production. They got a nice booth in there and nice chairs and couches and shit. So that's like, let's go upstairs and do the vocal, you know, do the vocals upstairs and leave the, the live room for... Um, for tracking drums or tracking live bands down there. Yeah. Because a few minutes ago when I mentioned that you guys, not a few minutes ago, but earlier, I mentioned you and the, the rest of the band members all had good jobs. And you're like, oh, yeah, I need to do this or I'm coding. And when you said coding, you threw me. Because I thought for your main job, that's what you did was like design and install and or fix and maintain high end audio diff- in, in New York. Is that- yeah, that's independent of the, the recording studio thing. So I do like residential for billionaires, homes audio video lighting shades i've been doing that for a long time that's like my my money gig need an intern? my own company yeah come on come on you need a, no seriously you need an intern no. look up above interns you. yeah look above you he'll be your intern oh this guy Fuck you know yeah. terminator cat six cable you got a gig no, i do not but i'm willing to learn <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome my best that's it you're on the list for potential installation guys yeah <laughs> all right um so that is your full time gig, is? Yes. Okay. Yeah. The audio, the audio, video installation world, or whatever, like home automation and, and all that stuff. Yeah. I've been doing that. I walked into like a stereo store in 1998, and I'm like, I can hook up this TV, and now it's turned into a career. Here I am, like you know, with my own company over 20 years later. You know. So. And do you mostly do that in the city, or do you do it out on the island too? Manhattan and Hamptons, cool. mostly. Yeah. <laughs> Bougie, yeah, it's hey, totally if you bougie. You want to make money, you got to go where the money is, man. This is yeah. true. That's why Girl Scouts sell their cookies outside of dispensaries. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I didn't know. Out here, they stand in front of the supermarkets, which is you know your audience, man. Good place. <laughs> oh wow, nice. that's cool. Um, so hey, I, you see behind me here, like I, I basically moved my whole mix rig into my apartment. So I have like another another room where I have, uh, you know, I can I do all the writing, I just pre pro stuff, and I can mix and master in here too. But I, I small rig, yeah, it's like I got a lot of gear. I've got serious gear, you know. So. You know what was like, that that yeah. that video you you posted a video of yourself like a year or so ago turning on that rig in the morning, and it was like <laughs> <laughs> it's like just fucking lights after lights after lights. Yeah, I'm going to sell it all and just do it all on the computer, I think. Yeah, it'll make well, my life easier. You're, you're on like the 30th floor of some high-rise now, aren't you? Yeah, 42nd floor. I'm, I'm getting out of here, though, because they're just, my COVID deal. It's taking quite a while to get all that stuff up to the 42nd floor, man. Woo. Well, yeah, they got nice elevators. I'm sure. <laughs> okay, so one trip, 10 trips? <laughs> a lot of trips, yeah. <laughs> I tried to make it mobile. I got everything in rack cases, so I can just like close them up and go. You know, there you go. Yeah, it's <laughs> awesome. Yeah, that's a lot of gear, but though. It is a lot of gear. It looks like you're in Brooklyn at the studio. Yeah. No, this is this is the home studio. Yeah. <laughs> I had something I wanted yeah. to ask you, Ken. If um, Dave, do you have anything else you want to ask about? Uh, what, what what's been going on here? Oh, I've been getting the next? clinic, man. I've been getting the clinic. He's just happy getting the clinic. Just learn. <laughs> it's awesome. Awesome. Um, so where where are you in? You're in L.A. proper. Like where in L.A. are you? I'm in the valley. Like it's North Hollywood, NoHo. 
Nice. Yeah. We got to hang, man. I got to come out there and let's, let's get some food. If you come out here, yeah. Yeah. Hit me up. Sure. We'll definitely hang. Absolutely. We'll do. We're gonna do Nam in January. Probably. Gonna be yes, there, that is yeah. supposedly I'll be there. supposedly the the uh, the word on the street is that next year Nam goes back to January. It's already yeah. booked. They've it is. Already, yes. Okay. Yeah, bro. It was dull as shit this year. I mean, I went on Thursday, so I don't know if it amped up over the next couple of days, but it it didn't. It's empty as shit. There's so much empty space that so they're not hearing. using right now. But, you know, me and my friend, we were in there and we're like, we were talking to Tim, one of the reps from Peisty. And it's like we were saying, it's like, it's April. You you guys are all four months into your business year. Who needs to have meetings and shit now? You know, it's like when they're, it's in January, it's like literally they're all there a week before having corporate meetings with the international staff. It's a whole different scenario in January. I'm by this point, everybody, everybody's bought what they need by this point, you know. I'm hoping this January will be a return to what was, you know what I mean? I think it will. Pre-pandemic, you know, because everyone was scared to go. And then this one in April, great. And I'm, I'm, you know, happy for Nam to do it and try and, you know, recoup what they have to recoup. But I I knew there was going to be a, a, you know, a tenth of the turnout just because of the way it is. Yeah. But January is open for it to be, the potential for it to be what it was is there. Well, It just depends on how many guys now are, still out you know touring like crazy trying to make up what they lost the last couple of years and how many musicians are actually gonna be able to go there and do their guest appearances and their performances and whatnot but i think i think uh i'm feeling well, this time cool. of year like there's so much so many tours active tours like i've been to like four shows in the last week like yeah. everybody's out on the road yeah. right you know between the and arts plus being out and the corporate yeah. headquarters of all these companies being done with their beginning of the year push you yep. know, they're not going to send them o- across the oceans. It's like there's so many international NAM goers that don't come out in April, but they will travel in January for sure. We'll be there. I'll be yeah. there for sure. And plus, it was beautiful in New York this weekend. Like, why am I going to go to Anaheim? You know I, mean? <laughs> I know it was worse yeah. in L.A. than it was right. in New York. Yeah. <laughs> we are not. I mean, you could laugh at me for saying we're still in winter. You know, it's like. 50s is cold to us but you know <laughs> yeah that's hilarious 50s like t-shirt weather for us it was i know i know I check know. this out last night at 7 30 at night here it was 82 degrees Shit. and this morning i woke up and it was 49 and then this afternoon it got to 52 or three. it dropped 30 degrees in a matter of 12 hours yeah it's, it's insane mm. you're in that that oh. it's that middle point of it breaking the weather's got to break we're I think it's going to freeze again. Right. Hopefully we're done. Yeah. Yeah. Are you guys good for time or I, mean, I had a couple more questions if you I'm I'm okay for time, but my phone battery, I got the notification that the battery's low. So I, I I'll probably be able to stick around as long as I, you know, another 10 15 minutes maybe. Yeah, I definitely want to ask this to see what's going on if anything um usually when we end these interviews we talk about what you got going on now and I know you've been busy on YouTube with the Stone Foundation, at least last year or the year prior, you were doing that with me. <laughs> that's, that's, yeah, that's very hardly developed. All right. Yeah, yeah. YouTube had to take a little back seat. you know. I mean, it's a lot of work, you know. To be a content creator on YouTube to make more long form is, that's a lot of work, you know. Crazy. Um, but I, that's why I focus more on the content on Instagram and then, you know, piggyback it with YouTube Shorts instead. Sure. Um, I have been recording lately, so I haven't been able to make my own content because I've been doing things for other people and the band. But, you know, it's it's one of those things where, like, you could have a million ideas. But really, I mean, time is everything. Elliot, like me, you know, it's like we're both we we actually, you know, we're adults. We got to earn a living and make money. I think a lot of people, especially in like the entertainment industry, you know, there's there's a very important decision you have to make about how you want to explore these industries. You know, do you want to be someone who's hustling day in and day out to make money for something that you love to do and then fight that stress of not making enough against how much you love it or just do it because you love doing it and be part of the more you know, projecting side, just putting it out there, getting it out there. And 
finding other ways to make your money so that you can be out there as a musician doing what you love. Elliot and I, we make music that isn't, you know, quote unquote, commercial or pop. So it's like, I think, you know, when you're working in that realm, it's way more important to to honor what you love and not get in the way of that. And the more you try to hustle making money as a musician, like I found, at least personally, the more annoying it became, like the more I worked for other people, the less musical I felt. So I, I just I enjoy being out there as, you know, a, a, if you want to call me a public figure in the music business, I enjoy that part being the more, you know, extroverted somewhat. It, it, I guess in simpler terms, it's like, do you want a reputation inside the industry or do you want fame and and notoriety with the with the audience outside of the industry and i prefer to have a reputation um a relationship with an audience and give something of what i have to them and there's not much there's no money in that so you gotta have a, a source of making money oh yeah you know? of course you know fame is not the money part money can come with fame but Fame, and I'm only using that term only because it's an easy word to use, but it's basically being someone who's a public figure presenting some kind of art form to the masses. And that's what Elliot and I do. We, we get on stage or we get on video, whatever we're doing, we're presenting a piece of ourselves and our passion and what we love to do to others. And that audience gravitates to it, but there's no like you know, foundational part of that, that says money must be made here. It's about giving art to others and reciprocating it in the way that they receive it and enjoy it. That comes back to us and motivates us to keep making it for them. But we're not using that as a form to become profitable in our own means. Like, like Elliot was alluding to before, the money that his band makes allows his band to be self-sustaining. That's all you could ever hope is that you're making enough money as the band, as the business, to keep being the band and keep being the business of that band. But to think that there's some kind of like extra profitable margin in that when you're making <laughs> deep art is insane. You have to find a way to make money outside of that. That's how much you make. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's, it's really not about making money. It's about you know, being it, it, I always go back to the 2112 analysis. Those lyrics are like almost like a a foreshadowing of how desperately lonely and, and horrible this world could be if we remove music from it. And it's almost like I'm, I do this as a selfless thing. It's something that like I even saw a video of John Mellencamp just the other day talking about it when you're an artist and this is what you do you wake up every day you have to do it those were his he's like you have to do it you can't go through the day without it otherwise you'll literally lose your own sanity the more you repress the need to do it so i don't need a dollar bill dangling in front of my face to get up and play the drums or try and create something musical it's like i just need to wake up and that's it so you mentioned doing keeping busy. You you mentioned I think you said session and then you said the band. Sensory deception. It's it's I call it a band, but it's really just me. But we need we need a <laughs> vocalist. That's that's really the key. I don't mind even you know we, if we if I got a guitarist to to redo the guitars or whatever. But really the main focus is is to get a really excellent vocalist. The main goal right now we're trying to get Greg Pucciato, but he's so busy. But his voice would be absolutely ideal on these songs. It would be great to have him. Nice. Yeah. So that's the next step with that. But yeah, I call it a band, but it's <laughs> No, I just wanted to plug it. <laughs> I wanted to plug it so people know what you're up to and where they can go find your stuff. You know Yeah, I mean? check it out. Sensory Deception. That's the band. I'll add links to everything afterwards in on the on the video that's gonna for be sure, covered. for sure. Yeah. But yeah, um that's awesome. And then you said you drums are done for the new car bomb. Yeah, and I, just to piggyback on what Ken was saying, like you know, having keeping the money and the creativity separate has given Car Bomb like the opportunity to just like 
do what we absolutely want to do, you know, and and that's been what has given us the cred with the bands who enjoy it because they're just like, you know, they listen to it and they're like, what the fuck is this? And then we can just continue doing what makes what like gets us all hyped up. You know what I mean? And I just want to keep getting weirder and weirder. Mm. you know and and heavier and heavier and just like but that that seems to be like our niche is like it's like what the fuck you know what i mean is should be the reaction to it and that's people you know it's never going to be a huge commercial success but it's going to be you know you're going to have enough of a following mostly musicians you know yeah that fucking will just dig into it because it's it's deep you know what i mean so they can just you know there's tons of tons of fucking information in there so that's what I love doing. That's what I just I, I just want to keep keep getting weirder and weirder, you know. New well, album's pretty weird. That's why you're both on here together. <laughs> I got another name for you, Ken. You said something else a minute ago, but I'll I'll go ahead and say you're you you both of you are living legends in the drum realm. I'm sorry oh, if that you. makes you feel uncomfortable, but that's that. the fucking truth. Having you both on here is an honor. And Dude, thanks for inviting us. Yeah. I mean, you know, and, and Dave on here, you know, I've known I've known his dad since I was nineteen. Now he's nineteen, twenty, and just to have you guys on here, Candiria, Carbomb at the same time, just from a guy who's played drums thirty years as well, but you know, owns this cool, you know, world recognized magazine. He started in his same room he's sitting in right now. Nice. I don't make shit from it either, really. I do it because I love it. And uh, yeah, since day one, baby, I'll fucking support you any way I can since day one. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Ditto. Love you. Yeah, love you, man. <laughs> love you guys, man. This yeah. is that's one thing I've I've always appreciated. Like even from when I was younger, and as it just got deeper and deeper, the drumming community is is a really Great. bonded community, man. Yeah. Maybe maybe I don't see it from the other music communities because I'm not on the inside of them. But it, I don't know. Guitarists seem like a bunch of jealous bitches. Maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> I just spit on my screen. Oh, you're so right too. <laughs> each other. Yo, all, all every show I go to, yeah, every show I go to is just a gaggle of drummers. Yeah, 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 yeah uh, for sure. That's hilarious. I'm I'm just kidding in 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 general though, but I I, I can speak <laughs> at least for the for the drumming community. We really, it's like it's such a bonded community. The drumming community as a whole is not trying to outcompete itself. It's just trying to get crazier and crazier, just become more rhythmically in tune, more knowledgeable, more wise. Like the amount of instructional shit that I see, not just on YouTube, but even flashing through the Instagram. It's it's amazing. Crazy. It's amazing. The, and it's just metal, making our, our art form better and better. The metal community in general, you know, we all know about the uh, the roof being ripped off the Apollo in Illinois with the Morbid Angel tour a couple weeks back. Well, unfortunately, somebody was killed and there was a lot of people injured. Um, I met up with them the other night, Morbid Angel, um, Crypta, the, the band from Brazil, the, the female death metal band, outstanding. And what's really outstanding about the show was anybody on that revocation was on it. I don't know if Ash is still here, but everybody on that package could have been the headliner. Um, wow. what, I, what I wanted to say was the the girls or the women, the ladies uh, from, from Brazil had rented an RV for the tour. And during the storm, the roof got ripped off and all that, and they were parked out back, and something came down, a part of a building or a tree or whatever it was, and smashed this RV oh, to nothing, goodness. right? And then for whatever reason, whatever company they, they went through um, wasn't covered at all. There was no clauses for act of God or whatever you may think um, you would have in a situation like that. They had nothing. Um, so the company decided to charge them $44,000 to replace the RV. And here's what the metal community did. And this is what's so amazing about the metal community versus other communities and metal shows in general versus other shows. If I, if I go with a friend of mine or someone to like a, um, like if I would, Whatever. I can't say Kid Rock because that's <laughs> country. Whatever it is. There's more fights at a country show at like a Six Flags, Darien Lake type of place than there is a metal show. And that could be for any other genre. You know what I mean? There's not really any fights. 
at metal shows. And if they are, if there are, I saw that show here last week. It was all love. We were hanging out all night. It it's quick. And they'll help yeah. and pick. It's so different. And the, and, and the, uh, the stigmatism or the, the stereotype or the cloud that, that, you know, we, some people think that <coughs> is the metal community because of the band names and the way people look or dress or sound is so backwards from what they really are. They lost the RV. Someone, a fan started up a GoFundMe. And in 26 hours, they raised $47,000. Wow. And paid off the RV and got another one to finish the fucking tour. Wow. That is what makes the metal community so special, man. Wow. So, wow is right. I couldn't believe it. She told me the story the other night when I met her. The drummer, Luana D'Amato, is her name. And she, she's like a she's like watching Gene Hoagland if he was a female. She was, fucking, she was fucking killing it. Yeah. Her Old feet. school death metal shit. Just, feet. Point yeah. heavy hitting, fucking smooth. Yeah. She was awesome, man. And I'm happy. I, uh, you know, I'm happy everyone came out and supported and helped the band get out um, out of that devastating, you know, <clears throat> debt, if you will. <clears throat> it's That's crazy. Okay. Yeah, because if nobody steps up, that forty four thousand is just. That's like a big That's deal breaker. Your head. You're like, yeah, I don't know if I can do the band anymore at that point. No. Are they there? Are they on a record label or anything? I don't even know. I don't. I don't know. I don't think so. It's almost like if they were, it's like, it's it's you know, there was no support coming from anywhere. I'm sure they called whoever they could, and it's like it took a GoFundMe and the metal community to make it all happen. That's yeah. Not only that, I mean, all the powerful. gear, all the gear that was on the stage. Luckily, nobody got hurt. You know. It sucks that anyone got hurt. I'm not trying to say yeah. that people in bands are any more important than people in an audience. That's not what I'm trying to say at all. Right. But the first band ended. Shit happened. Everyone was forced into a basement. The roof came in. People didn't get out in time. But um, the guys in the band and the crew were pulling people out, trying to lift all the shit out before EMS got there. It was like a real scene. Like, it was uh, a wow. real bad scene. Yeah. And Everyone lost gear. I think Morbid Angel lost an entire backline, everything. And also through friends and networks and GoFundMes, they were able to replace almost the identical backline and gear they lost in Illinois before. I just I want to say one thing. Gear. I want to say fuck insurance companies because there's some clause in there. I'm sure that's mandatory to have insurance on the rig, right? Because, But because it's some act of God or whatever, they're not going to cover it. You know what I mean? Which is a so funny thing like, I was talking to my wife about the other night, and I don't want to take this to a religious <laughs> place because it's a drumming magazine, but isn't that funny that there are act of God clauses in insurance policies when no one can prove there's a God? <laughs> take him to court. Sue him. Here we are paying for all that stuff. Yeah. We, Car Bomb had a rehearsal room that got destroyed in Sandy, and because we, and we had flood insurance, but because it came from a tidal surge and not from the sky, nothing was covered. Oh, of course. Those underwriters are slick. 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 Yeah. And I'm not, not saying there's anything wrong with people who are religious at all. Yeah. At all. So I just I'm got a saying, beef. I got a beef. That's all. There's these clauses <laughs> where they're going to screw all these people out of all this money because of something they can, they can put in there, you know, that's that's malleable, if you will. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, sorry. You're screwed. No. Oh, you're on tour? You're not from this country? That'll be 44 grand. Bye. Mm. Yeah, Awful. Yeah. Well, it all anyway. worked out. That was my tangent. Back to uh, good I job, think, Ian. I think that we have the best music community. Period. So. Oh yeah, we do. And I love all kinds of music. It's but- rooted in underground, so it's rooted in in more of a community mindset than a commercial. You know, people who go to pop concerts and things like that, they they it's such a like it's it's not a connected culture it's it's mainstream population you know they're not connected by anything That's you know, a, good point. a person who likes ariana grande could be any mainstream regular person everyday person where you know heavy metal although it became mainstream popular is built off of an underground community type of culture so even if you're at a Metallica concert with 40,000 people, everybody's still connected as one true energy. And in the audience, there's more drummers. So that's what makes it better. 
whether they're real drummers or air drummers, you know, it's like no. <laughs> that that well, is definitely the majority. You know, you'll get some, you know, air guitarists, but mostly everybody's an air drummer. Everybody loves yeah. the drums. Are those air guitarists bitches too? <laughs> I don't know. I haven't met any of them yet. <laughs> What's funny, though, is you mentioned Neil Peart, and thank you for saying his name right. Uh, I've only been saying his name right for a couple of years. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> but imagine, imagine. That's funny because Air Drummer, uh, that audit, uh, an arena full of people, <laughs> drummers and non-drummers alike, when that band was in their prime and even not in their prime, you could go into any one of those shows at any given time. You're going to see 90% of that room air drumming along to Neil. Oh, you yeah. Know what I, mean? mm-hmm. I, I always thought that was – or, or Gil Moore or something. But Neil takes the cake in that regard. Iconic, um, man. Yeah. Iconic is the right word. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Air drummer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Air drummer magazine. Thing, man. It's like that's the energy that <laughs> goes back to that when the artist sends that energy out into the audience. That it's undeniable to they can't help but try and be that interactive with the music. It's crazy to see that. Well, yeah, like as drummers, you guys like are the energy of the band. If you guys aren't playing, you know, hard, or you're not playing fast, I'm gonna be like, you know, whatever. But if you're playing like you're committed to it, you know, gonna kill it, I'm like, oh. No, it, it puts the whole rest of the band yeah, into yeah. a place where they mm-hmm. have to be at that level or harder. Yeah. Same wavelength, kind of. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Which adds again to why can um, Car Bomb is so special because of the longevity that you guys have experienced together. That you can play that crazy shit with other click. I still can't believe it. Well, you can't really headbang to it, but you know that the energy is there. So most oh, you can really headbang to it. It's all two four. Yeah, they, they try and <laughs> they try and start headbanging, and then they just lose it and just start killing each other. It doesn't Car bomb. The, every <laughs> song is written in the time signature of one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where's just count one? one. Just keep counting one. <laughs> well, if you bang your head long enough, the car bomb at two four, it's going to come back around. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man oh man that's great so far guys... i've gotten three low battery all right things all right uh, yeah i haven't died yet so i don't know how much longer i have well do you have any I other questions think... i'm done i'm good do you have any other questions for elliot or elliot do you have any other questions for ken if not we can just say our no, just, send, just send in love yeah awesome yeah man love yeah. all you guys man dave it was nice yeah. to meet you it was Dave, I'll see you at obituary in three days, probably. Or oh, whenever nice. that is. Three days? Yeah. Oh, no, it's in May. No, it's a couple of weeks away. Okay. What's up with there. Car Bomb? Are you touring this year? Uh, we do, we've got a bunch of shit in Europe in August, like festivals. And then we, I don't know what we're doing when the album drops. We start a whole other cycle. So All right. nothing, nothing solid yet. But yeah. yeah. I'd love to see you guys when you hit the West Coast. That's for sure. Oh, fuck yeah. Yeah, we got to get a hang in for sure. Get a hang in and definitely come check out the show. Oh, yeah. Fuck yeah, man. Well. Um, Ian, thanks been, for having us, man. It's oh, thank you awesome. for being here. It's been an absolute yeah. pleasure. Like I said, you guys are legends, and I'm glad it worked out where your schedules aligned because you're so stylistically similar in many ways and personality. Um, <laughs> I've been waiting for this one to come together, and uh, I appreciate it. And we're going to be doing a lot more of these, a lot of different guys. Maybe I'll have you pop in as a guest in the future, but keep us posted on what you got going on, Ken and uh, Elliot, and we'll be glad to help you uh, um, throw it out there into the world and get more eyes on it, whatever you're yeah, working. Yeah, man. Appreciate it. Love it. It's been awesome. Dave, thank you so much. It was fun. Hey. Clinic. It was a clinic for me too, man. Oh, my goodness. It was awesome. I just sat back and listened. And I just, <laughs> like, you know, I'm totally going to rewatch this and just listen to everything again and just take it in. Because <laughs> it's, it's, it's such – wow you know oh that's oh, awesome nice. and it's awesome to do this too to have this opportunity it really is so thank you ian for having me here oh thank dude you you're for... welcome man you're like oh yeah definitely keep keep this series up because it's uh yeah it's fucking awesome it's yeah. just getting legs now um so if yeah, you want yeah. anything specific added to the description links personal pages instagrams anything just shoot me a this message. is uh going on youtube is that what's going yes it's oh, on it's going youtube on... yeah it'll it'll live oh, on, on youtube okay cool oh, cool 
So whatever you want to add it in, just after we're done here, shoot me a message on text or messenger and I'll get it in there. And, uh, all right, sick. Um, thank awesome. you. Thanks, Ian. All um, right. And I'll end this broadcast the same as I do the other ones. And as soon as I hit this button and broadcast, we are done. We are done. Thanks, guys. Later. Later, y'all.